Washington International Single and the winner of World Rank Mercury. Just to finish the circle, so now my name is Hello and welcome once again to this fantastic arena in the middle of the forest here in Earthworld where we are ready to bring you all of the live action from first the men's and then the well, first the women's then the men's middle distance. The uh, Swedish women dominated the long distance and the Norwegian men uh, two days ago but will they do the same again? So just over just under half an hour ago we had the first woman into the terrain. They have uh, now we've had four women reach our first TV split points. They are well out on their way. Of course, they had to uh, face a qualifier three days ago in order to even get here to this middle final. So we will have the best of the world's orienteers uh, taking to the to terrain uh, later on this afternoon. So we're going to start, as I said, with the coverage of the women's finishing just before 4 p.m. this afternoon, local time, and then take a short break for continuing with the men. This is the women's course, though. Jonas. Yeah, um, we are at the same arena as uh, in the long distance and we get a quite an easy start into the race. I think the runners will appreciate it. It gives you some time to get on the map into the orienteering. I don't think it will be any problem until control three. Then the technical part of the course starts, control four, especially five when you have to control right after the green area uh, will be demanding. Uh, six, seven, eight, uh, good orienteering to get a nice flow for the runner. Uh, eight, it's quite tough to get up there actually. It's a physical, very tough course. Um, otherwise, in the white area, the visibility is very good. So I don't think it will be too many problems there for the runners. It's more the green parts that could be a problem. Uh, 13, we have a TV control and then this last part here is uh, very much about changing uh, the way you're orienteering. You have to be ready to go full speed from here because it's not in the same way technical demanding as before, but still you have to be careful with your compass and uh, with the direction. Uh, but you shouldn't miss the moment when you really can go full speed and you have to feel fresh in your legs still to be able to do that. Yeah, so that's the overview of the course, 5.5 kilometers, 225 meters of climb in that distance. And uh, so that's what the runners are going to be experiencing. Uh, so, we, yeah, we have our estimated winning time, 35 minutes. Uh, do you think that's about accurate, Ernest? Yeah, why not? It's quite a long course for the women. It's not uh, that much shorter than the men's course. Um, but uh, we know we have uh, two Alexanderson in the field. She can run nearly as fast as the men. So yeah, yeah, I think 35 minutes could be could be reasonable. And um, what about uh, the expectations of the course? Of course, a lot of uh, the runners have been putting uh, you know days and months of of training in this terrain. Is this course what they would expect? Um, well, after the long distance, yes. Before, maybe not. I mean, we have to start again in the arena. Um, and we see the terrain just beside the arena, especially in the eastern part, is, um, well, you wouldn't have to travel to Norway to find that. But it's a good course. Um, as I said, it's not too difficult, first three control, it's not too difficult for from 14 to, uh, yeah, to the last control. But still, you have to be very careful, especially in this part, because uh, 
you wouldn't want to lose some seconds there. And here we have a uh, route choice, control 3 to 4. The difficulty there is that you get up the slope and you have immediately, immediately to find the control, so you have no time uh, when you get up there to relocate or anything. You have to start uh, with your fine-tuning just before the circle. And that's, uh, that's not too easy, but uh, at the same time, if you're careful, you can see the, the green area behind up there, but of course you have to be aware of that. Here we get the, some impressions from the forest. It is really nice up out there, but it's also quite tough. You see the blueberries here. Uh, they don't look too demanding in this part, but it's the uphills and, uh, and some parts of them are really, really tough. So I think it will be it will be physical demanding, um, but otherwise the visibility is good. Um, as long as you have uh, contact with the map and you're focused, uh, this part shouldn't be a problem. Well, it, it's about. I mean, you have to be very quick in. Of course, when you do this, execute this leg, you have to be reading details, so you have to generalize the map and you have to be good at that and you have to be very quick if you want to be fast. So as soon as you get behind with your map reading and you're just picking uh, off things you see in the forest instead of knowing what to see, then you start to get slower and you should avoid this. So be quick in your head and uh, yeah, I think you have to put your focus on that and then you can adapt your running speed to this. Yes, yeah, so that was five to six, of course. And then some more potential route choice here to nine. Yeah, uh, interesting. I think you should go straight because the green areas, they look very green when you get there, but actually they're not that dense. The visibility gets very low, but I mean, you always have these small parts with white in between and uh, you have to be ready to fight in the, in the World Championships middle final. And I think you, as, as long as you get the direction and just fight through, you will get the chance to relocate when you get this yellow stripe there just before the control. But there you really have to know where you are. Otherwise, again, uh, when you come up, come up there, you don't have a lot of time to relocate. But then again, you have that vegetation that is quite good to see because of visibility. Isn't yeah, behind the control. Yeah. But you have to know that uh, if you don't expect it to be there, you will see it too late and then it's it's hard to... You will lose some seconds doing that. But of course, the runners should be aware of that and they will take this as a help, I'm sure of, of that. And here I think... Um, I haven't been in that green area, but it seemed to be a bit slower since there were more fallen trees just there. But of course you don't know that when you get there. Um, might be good to go to the right we will see. We, ha we will have to see here. This is the slope. Uh, one of the last controls in this very, or quite technical part. Here you have to be careful that you don't fall too much, that you don't go too much down in the slope, it's very tempting to do so, especially here it's still quite obvious where to go, you see this cliff to the right when you're running, uh, but after this it's very tempting to go too much to the right and down the slope, since there is, I don't know why, it's, it's just tempting to go there when you're running, And uh, but you have to be careful, keep directions and uh, try to see those knolls there, small hills. And then the, the, the control itself is a bit, the terrain the visibility will change a bit, just here. And then it's a bit harder to see, you don't see that before you saw like 50, 70 meters and here it's a bit less, so um, it changes a bit in the terrain and that can, that can be a difficulty. But still, I mean, the control is you won't miss that with a minute, but uh, you can miss this one with 10 to 15 seconds, and there might be just enough to to lose some places. 
Yeah, it might. We're ex obviously expecting the middle distance to be a lot, t hopefully a lot tighter than the long distance. Those smaller margins, that uh, shorter distance, shorter winning time, of course, as well. Uh, so most of the starters here have qualified by coming in the top 15 in the uh, obviously in the qualification races. Three heats there. There's over the top 45 athletes uh, qualified being the fastest in that heat and then the other 15 athletes the ones at the beginning of the start list they uh, were the fastest runner for their nation so we have a good mix of nations here in this final uh, and then of course the heat winners the top three in the heat they are the ones that are going later in this start list uh, with you can see the three heat winners Cecilia Fibra, Klusner, Camilla Olarsson and Tova Alexanderson as the last three starters. Yeah, quite a surprise that we see Cecilia Friberg-Klisner at the very end. I didn't expect that, but it was a really good performance by her. Uh, otherwise, as you said, I mean, we have the big favourites in the very end since they had to do the qualification. Um, it's mostly the same names as we had in the long distance, I would say. Um, we also have uh, the bronze medalist from last year, uh, a bit earlier in the race, but I don't think she will repeat that success from last year. The no. terrain is... Uh, this is Isia Basse we're talking about. Yeah, and it was... Yeah, uh, yeah sorry. <laughs> um, it's, it's different to last year. Uh, there we had more green areas. Um, I mean, it's a bit special. If you would ask a random runner here from the spectators race, many of them would say it's very difficult to do orienteering here. But on world-class level, you get so many features to to use for location and like do the orienteering part. So it's actually not that not that difficult as it seems, just because you have many details on the map doesn't make it uh, very difficult. And last year you had this green area, so you had to work a lot with your compass and direction. And it was, sometimes you had to be a bit lucky. I mean, if you were five meters more to the right, it could be that you missed the control or that, that, don't, or that you don't see it. And uh, that's not the case today. So. I, it would surprise me if we would see uh, a runner surprising us that much as uh, Isia Basse was doing last year. Yeah, I would agree there. So we're live with uh, Laura Vika, the Latvian. Mm. As I said earlier, this first part is really as you get a nice flow there. It's the visibility is great, um, you see all the features, it's very nice to run in there, but it's not very difficult. No, you can just take a compass bearing and then, yep, seen that, seen that, seen that hill, and that, yep, there it is. Um, it's quite a nice start when you're, you know, thrown into the terrain. It's a nice start and you can win some self-confidence. At the same time, there's a bit of risk that you overpace in the beginning and that you later on when you get into the technical part that you're already a bit tired in your head, especially since it's a lot of uphills just before control number four, um, and that you will have problems with that. But on the other hand, I mean, everyone here uh, had to do the qualification. Um, they know how to do orienteering, so they can handle this. They can indeed. Miri Tran Erdem is uh, next to start. Dane, who was 18th in the long distance a couple of days ago. And the Danes, you're, you're starting to feel that they are, you know, it's quite, it has been quite a young team and they've had a lot of injury problems as a, as a whole as a team in the last few years. But I think starting to make uh, some more impact. Yeah, it's, it's hard to say with the Danes because you always compare them to the times when they had the uh, Søren Bubak at their best when they had Maya Alm uh, in the team the and the well. Ida Bubak in the team. Um, and they are not up there yet. Uh, so it's very hard, but of course, I mean, Cecilia friberg showed that uh, she's ready in the forest as well. And we had others to qualify as well, but it's still when you're talking about the Danes, your expectations are quite high. So it's, yeah, but uh, it's a good trend, at least. Yeah, I think so. Maya Alm, of course, uh, not at these World Championships. Her focus is on athletics, on track and field, as she tries to make it to the Olympics next summer. Here you see where Jakob Kina is running. There's almost a small path just beside the marsh there, so it's quite good to stay down 
as long as possible and try to have control all the way to the circle as she's doing and then just head up in the last moment to get the control. Uh, if you do like Sar Sarkozy, you go up quite early and then you have to run in the slope, which it's quite stony there and it's usually not as fast as... Uh, yeah, I mean, you can follow this little path down there or like this track and, and the slope under the slope, just precise beside the marsh, and th this is quite faster. And here we see um, the difficulty I talked about when we went through the course. When you have the green area just before the control, then you have a low visibility. It's hard to uh, keep direction. You don't see the features as good as in other parts. And then when you come out of the green, you immediately have to be ready to, to see the control. And if you're just some meters to the right or to the left, you might not know where to go. This is uh, at split two. Or oh, the control before split two. This is, looks like control yeah. 12. Exactly. So they're on the way to control 13, which is located in a quite open part, which, de depending on what direction you're coming from, is <laughs> really shitty to run to, actually. Um, it might be a good idea to run, maybe we see the map later on, a little bit around to avoid these green areas before. Now we see they come down to this path, and there's an option now to go in straight. There are some cliffs there straight ahead and then you see this open area behind and this is on this if you take this route choice here the straight one uh, the open area is really shitty there yeah so it, if it if there will be some tracks later on that might be a good option my guess is that it's uh, an advantage to go a little bit more to the left just when you exit the control and then run around a bit to avoid this green area before the before the control we're back now at uh, split one, which we'll see all the athletes go on the way to control seven. So control seven is where we will get the uh, timing from. And uh, Florence Hanawa is um, the one we're going to follow. See here, it's in some parts it's quite stony in the forest, and that makes it, especially when you run in the slope, it's it's quite hard. It's not the fastest to run parallel to the slope, so it's a good idea when we see Control 4 in the women's class to stay under the slope and just head up in the last moment. Yeah, but this point on the way to Control 7, it's a lot. It's a lot better. There's much. There are fewer rocks, uh, things like that around. So um, this is pretty much like one of the nicest parts of the course I'd say maybe apart from the first three controls uh, it's quite good and you can see the features quite well um, in terms of the visibility also like seeing the shapes on the ground you saw here that she was not really prepared for the direction after the control she rounded the control after she punched and the, especially when you have such a good visibility you see the control quite early you should try to as soon as you see the control you should try to go on and read the next control so you have at least the direction out of the control ready when you punch it. Hannah Wisniewska here, also on her way to control uh, number seven. And we saw uh, Florence Hannah taking the new lead by 48 seconds. You can see that. But it's looking good for the pole here on her way to control number seven. You've got to take the opportunities where you can to check the map, where maybe where it's a bit less rough underfoot, and you can keep going whilst uh, you know checking the map and be sure that you aren't going to trip or fall or anything. You could see here she had the direction out from the control ready, um, so she started to go in the right direction, and then uh, of course she had to do some more map reading, but she was ready to go into the right direction. I like that more than the, the runner we saw before. So here's a comparison of the two runners we've just seen into Control 7. 
Mm, and we see here that uh, Wisniewska is running around the green area. And now uh, it's going more straight. It's a bit more difficult to go straight, but I it could be a bit faster if you hit the control directly. I think, Hannah, you see in some of the earlier um, controls just being, I think, a bit hesitant with her orienteering and not taking that full speed the whole way through. And that's the differences we're going to see at this point in the start list. As you see Bridget Anderson, the Australian, beginning her race, only doing the middle distance, or at least not doing the long distance um, at these World Championships. So her first time uh, starting from this arena. We've had the start for both the middle and the long distance from the arena, which may not all the runners were expecting. I think that certainly in the long distance, once they had it in the long distance, they will reassess and probably assume that the start of the middle distance is also going to be in the arena. Mm -hmm. Very similar uh, information in the uh, Pre-running information to run and get the, the distance from the pre-start to the start was almost the same too. You could guess it out, I think, where the start would be. Yeah, I think you'll have fewer surprised runners today mm. compared to the long distance when even like the the course itself and the the characteristics of the course itself were quite a big surprise for the runners with lots of opportunities to run around with that often being quickest and times on the um, yeah on the golf course. Here this we are at control 13 and this is this green area I was talking before so this is very dense and if you come a bit more from the right as you see the runner here um, you have a better entrance to the control otherwise you have to uh, fight through this green and bushy area so I think uh, the American runner here is doing a good choice. Yeah, well, she will take the lead by just under four minutes. Mm -hmm. She has a suspiciously Norwegian name as well. Not really on the way, on the right way there. Yeah, maybe. It's hard to tell where the, where the camera is. Yeah. Here we are at the control. Yeah, there she is. Oh, that's the wrong direction. She's yeah. in the larger of the the larger re-entrant, which is to the northeast, I think, of the actual control. The controls in a re-entrant in the woods, so you have to see you see the, this tree that you can literally see at the top of the shot. These those are the white section, I think, in the woods, and that's what you I think you really need to be looking out for to give you the confirmation that it's the right re-entrant. I think she spotted the TV camera and got a bit nervous now, so she's just trying to get away from the camera. That is my impression. She wasn't really trying to relocate properly. Because the runners know that the, well, we'll guess that the cameras are a bit away from the control to spot the runners going towards the control. Mm, but it's, uh, it's a mobile camera, this one. It's not a fixed one. So the cameraman can be moving a little bit. But of course, usually the cameraman sees the control from where he stands, so it can be a uh, tactic to run towards the cameraman and look, take a look around. So now we, the runners will head down the hill there towards the golf track and then uh, come into this area where it's very, very fast in the end. So Lara Vika going at the there. Yeah, when you get to Control 13, which is where we just uh, saw the American runner, then you, that's kind of the end of the 
maybe the most physical part, and then the orienteering from there changes to a different kind of physical. Yeah, I, I was about to say because it's very physical in the end as well, but it's not as you don't have to use, t you don't need that much power in your legs, but you need the speed then. Here we see Emily Kemp and Wisniewska. And most of them are choosing to go over in the northern more most um, bridges over this uh, river. Pretty similar times. It's a very rocky slope, that one, as you can see on the map. You've got to try and pick a good line through. Yeah. So we see here again, Wisniewska had no problem taking the control because she was rounding the green area. Camp was a little bit hesitating there, losing some seconds. There we have her, Emily Camp. Three years ago, when the World Championships were in Sweden, quite similar kind of terrain, not very far away from here. She came fourth. See the visibility is is quite good. You see the contours, the the hills around, so you can use them to locate and like it helps you to keep direction. Of course, if you move, if you lift your head and have your view straight forward, then you can use that. If you're not glued to the map with your eyes, that's always a bit of risk when you have so many details to read. So you can see checking the uh, code, checking the control descriptions on the way out. And I think, does she have a little peek to the left mm -hmm. on there? She already knows the direction that she's going to leave the, uh, the control. Here's Erdem. Erdem. So Emily Kemp went second at that point. Here's the Dane. Catching, it seems. Uh, she was 34th in the middle distance in last year's World Championships. Uh, has had much better results in the long distance. Uh, 18th a couple of days ago. Looking good so far on this middle distance. Of course, we are now uh, looking at runners who qualified uh, in the top 15, only just in the top 15, but they uh, mm, Again, did hit that here spot. we see that the direction out from the control is not really ready when she ap approaches the control. So she has to round this small hill. Uh, I would say the fastest is to turn around and uh, leave the control backwards. That's a different route now. She's the first one, I think, going to the left there. That, that's actually an option in uh, this course. But it's a bit more difficult because you have... Uh, otherwise, you have this quite given line to follow the slope uh, and also the marsh, uh, which you won't get if you go straight. Of course, it's a bit shorter when it comes to distance. But it's also more difficult. And you can't have the speed as high as uh, if you follow the marsh there. Yeah, but I wonder if she lost some time there. It's quite possible because she had built up quite a lead after for the first three controls over Wisniewska anyway. But yeah, the, the gap there, 47 seconds. Uh, so quite a significant gap at this point. Uh, with only at control seven though. 
had 22 runners through that point. And the time is beginning to tumble very quickly, of course. We have an estimated winning time, as we said, on this course of 35 minutes, that very typical middle distance. This is Lizzie Ingham, a New Zealander, uh, who also runs for Halden Club. 25th in the long distance. Got the feeling that she had quite a good year now. She. Uh, I mean, she had a lot of struggles with injuries uh, the last years, but it seemed that she really managed to come back in a good way and uh, has good results nowadays again. Here we see that uh, Miri Tranyadum, she had a good start into the race. But also Ursula Kadan, they were quite close here. So let's see if Kadan is... No, she's choosing differently. That's actually quite a good. Yeah. There's a little path there between the cliffs, which is quite good. It seems that she took her quite a while to get up there. Let's see. Uh, my taste, she's going up a bit too early there and fighting in the slope. I don't know if it's just uh, the GPS or if she really went up there. Um, but my opinion is that you have to stay down the slope for as long as possible and then go up. And here we see that uh, again, when you go straight, uh, there's a risk that you do a mistake in this green area, which you don't have if you go around, because the green area is very, very good visible. Yes, just didn't no, go far enough. Some problems with direction. That's my feeling. I mean, you. There's no reason that you leave the, the red line at this point. She's even doing some more climbing there. Uh, but she noticed that and could uh, adapt her direction. But that's. Uh, I mean, she lost a lot of time there. Almost a minute. Mm. No, I don't know. We're somewhere in the forest. I don't see Ursula Kadan. She was uh, 20th in the long distance. Let's see if we can find her. She did look like... Well, let's see if the cameraman can find her. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Oh, there, there we go. Is. Good spot. Oh, well, she's managed to get the direction into the control, but I feel like not running with that much confidence. No, of course, she lost some of the confidence in the green area there. And you really ha need to have the confidence um, in this part, at least that in that matter that you trust the direction and the compass because uh, that's your best friend in this part. Of that's like the, the first thing you check. There's no option in, in route choices here. You have to go straight from the beginning. And then the second thing, you can start to generalize the, the features and try to like get some help on the way when you're holding direction. Yeah, try and simplify the features yeah. so you don't have to read everything or you don't have to hold that picture of what everything looks like in a map so you can really you know easily think okay i've got to go down the slope to the um stream and then up again kind of between two hills and really try and simplify just checking the code there and again not really ready with the direction 
Let's have a look at this replay then. Ah, loses the direction again. Okay, you can go around the, the hill there, but still, I think you should immediately turn and then go back and not round this, go down and round it. So Kadan losing direction towards control number six, I think twice, maybe having to relocate to get to the control. And then, uh, yeah, different uh, route choices being made for the, for the next part. Let's have a look here. Yeah, Wisniewska is going all the way around. It's hard to compare them. I, my opinion, Sarkozy didn't go too good there in the beginning. It was a bit shaky, it felt. You should really just go, use your compass, take direction, and run as fast as you can through the green area. There's no reason to read anything in the green area except for <laughs> look, uh, take some looks at the compass, but otherwise uh, you just have to get through because you won't see much anyway. Here's uh, Wisniewska uh, on his way to control 13. Struggling here. This is so she. I think we saw that she came further south with the control and is now going to approach it maybe more from the top, but yeah, is heading in the right direction now. And you see that it's physically very tough course. It's you have many of these tough uphills, short uphills, very steep ones. And you also need to be very confident going down hills as well. Yeah. Climbing through this section of green before they go into the golf course, as we said. Stake from Liga Valdemain. That's control number one. Yeah, but I think she maybe did a wrong choice here for this leg. So I think you can better. And Erdem is still the leader at control seven. So we're comparing all of the routes to hers. Yeah, and she's going up there. Um, this re-entrant, there's like a small path up there, so it's a good way to get up. It feels quite, uh, you can, you feel quite confident when you go up there because you know exactly where you are. But still, I mean, it's a bit early, it's quite stony there. But it's, uh, I mean, that's a matter of seconds, so. But now we should soon catch uh, the Latvian in our picture. Sure enough, here she is. On the way to six and seven. And uh, the Latvian team, actually all of their runners qualified for the final. So great news for them. Switzerland, Finland, Russia, Sweden, Czech Republic and Latvia, all of their uh, runners managed to qualify for this middle distance final. And caught up, uh, that's probably Bridget Anderson, the Australian. And then we wait for her closer to the control. Losing a little bit of signal out there, I think. Here we go. So the two runners coming from a slightly different direction, but the visibility is good here. They should be able to pull themselves back on track quite easily. In fact, maybe the Latvian just a little bit uh, at her line. Her direction wasn't quite as good. But you do get some good feedback from catching up runners. Here's Megan Carter Davies. First of the three British women to have qualified for this final. Uh, looking very good. Megan's had uh, good results from um, races in the UK this spring. Been impressing with her speed. But unlike the other two British women in the team, she doesn't live in Norway, hasn't had the same opportunities to train, has been uh, training alongside a full-time job uh, since graduating from university. So um, 
it's great to see what she can achieve and, and what she can achieve in the future as quite a young runner. Yeah, and obviously she had a good start into the race here. Be interesting to see some of her route choices in the beginning, or if it's just the speed. But uh, she's half a minute faster almost. So we rounding the control as well there. Yeah, let's see here. Compared to Miri Trane Erdo from Denmark, see that she is choosing another route here. Also going up there quite early, but uh, executed it well. And then rounding the green a bit more than Trane Erdo. And uh, see here, that's more or less the difference between the two runners. But she did look like she made a small miss at control number three. She was just a little bit lower down um, on the other hill, just on the edge of the circle, it looked like. This is Emily Camp from Canada, heading up in this very bushy area just before control 13. Um, Realising that it's very bushy on the straight line here and drowning it a bit which, as I said earlier, I think is a good choice. Yeah. Even if it's, it's still not nice here, but it's better. <laughs> yeah, it's better than some other parts. And this grass just gets in your face and um, could be worse, but it's, it's certainly uh, not fun to run in. You don't feel like you're going to, you don't feel like you're moving very quickly or any, uh, at any point here. I mean, if you compare it to the part of the forest they have been before, this is not very enjoyable here, <laughs> no. but it's only some meters, and then it uh, will open up again. The camp looking good, so you got two minute lead there over Pika from Latvia. Now she gets into this down to the golf course and then into this very fast area where you really have. You have to be ready to yeah, change sorry. the kind of orienteering and, and uh, dare to push clean, very hard if you want, want to get a good result. Saila so Kinney here only uh, running the middle distance. So it hasn't been to this, starting from this arena before. Let's have another look though at these route choices. Kemp going a lot straighter. Mm -hmm. But she, in the end, she went out to this small path anyway. There's also an option to go a bit more to the left and more straight up the hill. And it looks fast going out towards the um, semi-open area for Erdem as well. You see that Erdem is doing a big ah. mistake there. She wasn't at the control. Um, which I think is quite unnecessary because you have this hill there just beside the path which is actually quite good visible first you have the hill uh, let's say 100 meters before the control just north of the red line and then you get another hill to help you with the direction when you're actually at the first hill you should be ahead and be aware of that you want to see the next hill and if you, you could you can see it from there so it's I and think those he was not really are ready yeah. to, to read and simplify the, the legs or like this leg as, as much as it as, as she needed or make it yeah and then you can have problems with direction and when you once you're more or less lost in this slope then it's of course more difficult to relocate yeah you could see it was uh, where she was lost on the slope it was really difficult to relocate but if you're approaching if you have have good direction into that control it is fairly good to see the features you cross the um, track you have and there's one re-entrant and then you're into the next one and the the seeing the small patch of green is it's quite good visibility to see that too and that's more or less the the story of the whole course i mean as as long as you're with the map and you're aware of what to see you will see the the things but as soon as you get away from from the direction you wanted to have uh, you will always find something that suits your picture you have in, in your head, uh, how it should like, and then you can do parallel mistakes, or you just think that you you don't have uh, the time to, to stop and relocate, and then you go on, go on, and then you do mistakes. 
So this has been how it starts. Uh, she was fourth in the middle distance last year, and uh, but quite an early start from her. Uh, compared, well, first of the Swiss women to start. So it means she uh, qualified a little bit further down, but you know you just need to qualify, uh, and you can you can have a look uh, from the qualifications who was who had great speed and everything, but you never really know quite how people uh, approach them, how people try to race them. So we saw uh, Gabia Rosatita from Lithuania take second fastest uh, here, uh, on the, which we get the time at control number seven. Alexandra Hornick from Poland, though, is now on her way. I think she has a chance to beat the time of Megan Carter Davis. Looks good here with the direction. She seems to have control over the situation. Yep, and approaching the control here. I think she too just checking already the routes out of the control, checking the way. It's quite a short control to number eight. And she will have spotted this flag from a long while back. You can see she turns around and knows exactly what she's doing. I think that's very interesting. You really see the differences here, how well prepared the runners are. Uh, for the next control. See, yes, maybe yeah, that's more miss from Carter Davies. Yeah, only a few seconds though. Mm -hmm. They're both going to the right. Oh, oh that's interesting. Only going straight over the marsh there. It was quite okay, obviously. Yeah, it looks reasonably good. It's very hard to say where they go up the slope there. Um, I mean, the GPS, especially in slopes, usually is not very, very accurate. So it's hard to say if they went up early or if they waited a bit. Oh, that's a bad direction by Carter Davis. I don't know what she was doing there. We might not see her in the lead the next uh, TV control. But Alexander Hornick there goes uh, four seconds faster than the Brit at that point, control number seven. And uh, she's number 31 of 60, so about halfway through the start list. We can clearly, Maria, see that the speed is higher now for these ladies. She has a Next to start, uh, she knows number 38. Mm, did uh, quite a good qualification. Fifth, no, eighth place there. Yeah. Elena Ross. Also, she uh, didn't run the long distance. Mm, and I think that's an interesting name here. Uh, she's been training a lot in the terrain around uh, Halden. She has been uh, running for the club for a while, and uh, they also have been living here, uh, Elena and Florian Hovald, um, to prepare the, for the World Championships. And I mean, she has great results from earlier years. Uh, so that could really be a runner who could set a good time here. So now we've added Isia Basse, of course, the surprise bronze medalist from last year in the middle distance. Where does she stack up compared to the rest of them? Again, going through the green, seeming to have pretty good direction. Mm, and it looked, uh, technically, actually it looked really good. It seemed that she simplified well. She wanted to see the, the cliff there and then continuing running from one feature to the other through the green area, which I think it looked good, but I don't know if the speed is high enough. I mean, if we compare her to the uh, other early runners here, if she wants to fight for the, for the medals again, she has to be uh, in a clear lead here. So we could see she was 15 seconds behind Alexander Hornick at control five. <laughs> see what that is by the time she gets to control seven. Here's number six. Little marsh. I think you can already see, possibly on the ground there, some small tracks and small trails. In some parts. Uh 
of the legs, you can see it, but mostly it's the most obvious parts anyway, so it's the when, where the forest is a bit more open and then when you get in these areas here where you actually can do different micro route choices, uh, usually it splits up a little bit more, uh, but I'm sure towards the end, especially when we see the men start later on, in some parts there will be small tracks. So Basse you can goes see for third. You can see, I mean, her technique is is really good. It's not it's not a surprise in that matter that she took a, a medal or a good position last year. It's more about that compared to other runners, it seems that they have just a little bit more speed in their running. And uh, I think last year suited her pretty well because if you overpaced, then there was a very big risk that you took a wrong direction a bit or that you that you did mistakes, but I don't really see that happen today. Carolyn Olsen then into the terrain, sixth place two days ago in the long distance. Um, not in the best shape beginning these World Championships with some injuries. Um, and I think was annoyed with uh, herself with her run um, two days ago. Um, so we'll try and uh, improve on her position. Really, you could see herself psyching herself up, um, really trying to get in the zone beforehand. This is Vendila Hotichkova from the Czech Republic, who uh, was 12th in the long distance. And um, with her and Denise Kosova uh, both uh, having good results in the long distance, then I'm sure the, the Czech women will be able to put together a really competitive relay team. And good support from the crowd as she heads out into the terrain. And she was one of the runners who surprised me a bit in the long distance. Uh, seems that she took uh, one more step from previous years and is closer to the very top at the moment. So it will be very interesting to see what she can do here on this middle distance course. So uh, this is Emily Kemp. She's gone through the arena passage and this is her in the last uh, sections of the course. And here we see this is up to control 17, I would say. Um, on the map, it looks very off open and uh, and easy but as, as you can see here it's not very nice it's very bushy um, i mean navigation if you have the direction you can see the open area uh, on the horizon there uh, the runners they see that so they it's no problem with with the distance but you have to be careful with direction and you can miss the control by some meters well, you can see that the, this open area, you know, goes out in front of you, spreads out quite wide, like it's in a line that's perpendicular to the direction you're running. So you not you you can't just head to a point. You can get the distance, but you can't. Um, you still have to, as you said, get the direction. But you can, uh, if you have a, a clear line behind the control. You, if you really want to play it safe, you can try to get 10 or 15 meters too much to the left. And when you have the right distance, then you just turn to the right, and then you won't have this uh, insecurity if you're too much to the left or to the right. So you, I don't think we will see runners missing that control more than 10, 15 seconds. But still, you have to be very careful. And this control here, um, I experienced it a bit more tricky than it looks on the map, since you really have to fight through the green to this hill, which we see coming here. And you have to go all the way to actually see the hill. So. But again, if you do the if you do the work and if you are well prepared, then that control isn't a big problem. Yeah, it looks pretty good, and but uh, pretty distracting for some being chased by the camera here. How do, can some people train for this? How do some people train for this? Um, well, you, of course, you can train. The distraction, I don't know if, if you can go specifically for cameras, but you can, of course, stream distraction. I know the Swedish team, they do it sometimes where they have a stereo with them and uh, have uh, like this, the arena speaker, which they've taped um, beforehand and they're running with someone behind them with the arena speaker on high volume just to get some distraction in the forest. And, uh, but it's a difficult thing, especially with cameras, because 
if you're down in a training behind someone with a camera, the effect is not ex is not at all the same as if you have that in a in a world championships. But of course, you have to train distraction as well. Sarah Kinney here. She's lost a bit of time on Alexandra Hornick, who's still the. Uh, leader and she, oh, she's not quite got the direction. We've seen most of the best ones turning around at this point, and then she she does so a little bit later. Let's have a look at uh, the tracking from very, Sabine Hauswirt. Very fast start from Hauswirt here in the beginning, and it's just running part. Seems also, I mean, it's the tail is a minute, and this is almost 45 seconds. So good start here. Uh, in my opinion, that's a good route choice as well. Going up there, going early up the slope. Here we are with uh, Sabine Hauswirt on the way to the first split. But here into the finish. We have Emily Kemp following her quite a long way around this course, the Canadian. And look at the time. She's going to set a new fastest time, sprinting all the way into the finish. Uh, she didn't run a long distance, but had a great one around this middle, going, pushing herself all the way around. And let's have a look. She will take the lead. Crosses the line setting a new leading time she will get to sit on that leader's chair 44 minutes 48 and um, well it's a new leading time but that time's going to get quicker and quicker very very rapidly without expecting winning but time of 35 still it's 10 minutes down to 35 she seemed to have a fairly okay race maybe they won't get go down on the 35 somewhere around 37 and 36 I expect them to go. So Halsfrit is still on her way to control number seven. Very close now. And look, as you can see, she had a minute lead at control number five. It's not quite that anymore. Mm -hmm. 51 seconds. Again. Also alongside Lenka Meklova. She was not totally prepared here. But it's uh, 51 seconds lead, so that's uh, quite a good start anyway. So Anastasia Rudnaya, he is about to start. She took ninth place, uh, her best ever result in the long distance two days ago. So in a good position, feeling good uh, for this middle distance, we hope. And in fact, she's just about to cross paths there. Um, they, they run out in the opposite direction as the arena run through. Bridget Anderson. It was not only the best uh, long distance result, it was the best individual result. So that's an uh, indication that she's in a good shape. Rutnaya. So let's have a look at uh, Hornick here. Yeah. A bit surprised that all the runners, they leave the control there quite much. They, they make quite a way around, crossing the oh. middle there. Oh, that was a big mistake. Yeah, there she lost uh, a minute at least. So that's the second runner we, we've seen just on this tracking to make a mistake at control number 11. And again, I think you should run it exactly as uh, Emily Kemp was doing with going to the first hill and then take a look at the second hill. You will see it from the first hill, run to the second hill, and from there it's uh, really an easy catch. So we're now looking for Gabi Arazatuta, the Lithuanian. So Emily Kemp is still our leader at this point with Megan Carter Davies in second, just seven seconds behind. We never saw whether she made a mistake from seven to eight, uh, Carter Davies, but we're now looking for uh, Azaduta. And also we've had uh, Hornick, of course, pre-warned at this point too. But maybe if you're looking to be approaching from the bottom, it's not the fastest way. Yeah. It, it I was just about to say it, it's really not the direction you want to come from. It's not nice. I don't know if it's fast, but it's at least not nice to 
to be there. Nah, she was pre-warned in the lead, but loses that lead. Three seconds there. So Emily Kemp still the leader. She is the leader at the finish as well. Oh, that's really nothing I would expect there. A mistake in this first part. It shows me a, that she might be a bit nervous for this race. And again, she's, if, I think if you go to the left, you have to do it directly from, from the control. Um, so not a good start for Elena Roos. And maybe hesitant, she came up the top of the hill at four, just came up a bit early. And then again, a uh, small mistake in the green area there. So not a good start for Elena Roos. Not at all, actually. It seems that she's a bit nervous and like she wants too much. She's not calm in her orienteering. Maybe it is because of the first mistake that she then thinks, oh, this is a middle distance. I, if I want to fight for top six, I really have to push very hard now. And then it's just <laughs> those small things you don't do right or not as good as you would do it uh, if you if you feel ca calm and self-confident. Yeah, often if you feel like you have to catch up time, you're running faster than you would navigate. And, you know, that's a problem that, you know, a lot of us have with our orientation. Yeah, and, I mean, everyone knows it. You can't catch time. You can just lose time. But still, you really have to fight against this feeling to, to try to catch time again. Because, I mean, you can't. Why should you suddenly be able to run faster than everyone else? You can just try to run as fast as possible and avoid doing mistakes. But you can win back time in that matter. Quite much to the left here. Mm -hmm. And you can see that this is the, a shot of her approaching the control and maybe, yeah, a little bit too far to the left. Not too much, though. Still OK. Punching the control there. There goes six. And the leader, Sabina Halsewit, at that point. We are waiting for Caroline Ulsson from Sweden to the first split. You can see in the graphic on the bottom of the screen there, 31 seconds uh, down at control number five. That's the pre-warning control that we have. And then we'll get uh, another time check compared to all of the other runners um, at number seven, of course. See that the time is running out compared to Sabina Hauswitt. Already now, there's some meters to go. Our direction of approach is a little bit better though than the Swiss runners. And 21 seconds, so caught up another 10 seconds between five and seven. But uh, now we can see Isia Basse. She's going up the crags into this open area uh, on her way to control number 13. And she's got a minute to be faster than Kemp. Two minutes, sorry. And uh, this, uh, I mean, she, uh, as I said before, technically it looked very clean, very good. Um, let's see where she's coming up here. I hope not from that direction. Oh yeah, there she is. There it's really, really dense. Especially in the beginning. Uh, yeah, you can hear the sound of the wind. It's got quite windy in the arena here with some threats of a little bit of rain. But yeah, it's so difficult and not very enjoyable in this really tough open area. Here is the control though, and now just heading down the hill. That's the most of the 
physically tough part to go. That's most of the contours navigated anyway. And um, she makes her way down the slope. So went yeah. fastest there. But she lost some time compared to Emily Kemp. Five seconds, I think. Let's see what happened here. See that Isabase is going around the green area with not the best direction. She's staying down there a bit too long. But that open area by 10 is really obvious to see, so I don't think people will miss that control. It's not mistaken to number 11 as well for Basse, mm -hmm. but not as big as Hornick though. Kemp did a good job to control 11. You see the difference here. I, l I like the way Hornick was attacking the control. I think that's a that's a good decision to take the passage between the two cliffs there. You see here that direction is not the best of uh, Megan Carter Davis, and now she is already at the yellow area. Ooh. She didn't seem too happy about it. No, she came through the arena in the lead. There we go, there's the control. Yeah, you can see that her direction was just a little bit off. Was quite much off, actually. Yes, yeah, sorry, <laughs> I'm being too nice. You see there, Emily Kemp coming the, into the picture as well with a much better direction. So the GPS is about 15 seconds behind the picture that we see on the screen. Mm -hmm. And we are, of course, uh, live with Megan Carter Davies, so Emily Kemp. Uh, I mean we have her in the finish already, so it still looks good for the best time here for Megan Carter Davies. <laughs> Fighting through the green area quite high up here. I hope she won't miss the hill. No, now she's turning. Yeah, there's the hill. There we go. She's still just, you can see her looking around. And then two more controls now. Start, May Rantanen, Finn. So, number 49. Yeah, yeah. Took 17th position in the world champion in the long distance 2019. She does have a silver medal from the middle distance back in 2015 in Scotland. Had quite a big uh, part of the of Team Finland, the women's team, missing last season the World Championships because of uh, maternity leave. Three out of four runners to start line today. We, here we have uh, Sabine Hauswirt choosing to use the path there and then go straight through the green area. She's not afraid of uh, taking the fight there with the green area, which I think is quite okay. It looks good here. She's very much glued to the line here. Gets this first hill, second hill, no problem at all. Looks good for Sabina Hauswit. And you can see they're over 60 seconds faster than Basse. And we know that Basse is still in the lead at the second TV control. That's control number 13, yep, as you can see on the map. Yeah, see that 1 minute 41 second lead at control 11, which is our pre-1 in control. Here we are at control 12. She's together with Lenka Meklova from the Czech Republic. And making sure she reads the detail and makes the right decision about the route to control 13, which way to approach that um, re-entrant. But look, she's got a good buffer with three minutes to make a new leading time. If you can see a bit the difference here in the downhill running between the Swiss runner and the Czech runner. Oh. 
seems that Mausfeld uh, is really ready to attack the terrain, tackle the terrain today. This is Megan Carter Davis. Yep, and uh, coming in here for a new leading time. So Megan Carter Davies taking the lead there by 31 seconds faster than Emily Kemp. So we'll be, I think, uh, a bit annoyed with those small mistakes at the end of the course, but look like uh, she made some good decisions to some of the earlier controls. So we'll see how that uh, stands her once all the runners have finished, of course. But still pretty good feeling to be uh, in the lead when you arrive at the course. So how to it here. She was uh, one minute and six seconds ahead of uh, Isia Basse at the first TV control, but now they are hesitating here. Uh, I don't know why this hill is very obvious where the camera is standing. But that's the advantage of being uh, two girls or two women in a group. If you're hesitating, maybe the other one will take, will take over. So a uh, new best time. Uh, Sabine Hauswirt from 47 ahead of ECR Passé from France. But Hauswirt again having to look at the map on the exit of the control quite a lot. Um, we saw it as well when she exited control number 12. Maybe not at the moment, not very far ahead in her navigation. But these are the standings though. Of course, it's also a little bit because of she did, she did just a mistake before the control and then you don't really get the time to be prepared out of the control uh, that follows. If you're very confident into the control and see all the features you want to see, then you get a bit more time to prepare yourself. Uh, Lenka Meklever is there, also went through in third place there, the Czech athlete, who we just saw running with the house it. Ben Lahayu now setting off into the terrain. Also on the podium two days ago, the long distance sixth from her. Another of the Finns returning from maternity leave. Glad to be back out in the, there in the forest. Now let's have a look at the track of Denisa Kosova, the Czech athlete. Was it difficult? Quite a good start here. Uh, it seemed that she lost physically in the very beginning up to the first control, but uh, from then it's good, it's almost the same speed as Sabina Hauswirt. And she's together with Kat Taylor there, I think. Yeah, it looks like she's caught up Kat Taylor by four minutes. And they're catching on Anastasia Rudnaya, who's just actually punched control number seven. So Kosovo here won't be as fast as Hauswit, but nearly there. And good uh, speed through the control, good flow. Yeah, and of course it helps it that she caught uh, Kat Taylor. First of all, it's a good feedback you get. I mean, Kat Taylor has, done, has had great results earlier years. So you know that you can trust her and then you get some help leaving the control. This one here, this runner, Evelyn Kasku, one of the big surprises for me in the qualification. Uh, did a great qualification with the uh, third place in her heat. I didn't expect that, but it's very nice to see Estonian runner here. Yeah, let's see what she can do in this final. Here we see the comparison between Sabina Hauswirt and Karin Olsson. It seems that uh, it's a good thing to go very straight, but as I said before, you have to be ready to to fight through the green and uh, attacking the terrain here. But then uh, through this yellow part, uh, it was a bit hesitating by Olsson. Don't know, maybe she might get got stuck somewhere a bit. Yeah, I can maybe house it's like micro route choices through the open were a bit better. And then Ooh. a mistake there. I actually 
I don't really get that because it seemed that she did the work. She had the first hill, the second hill, and as soon as she got to the second hill, don't really understand now what she, she thinks where she is when she gets to this second hill, just behind this path. And now she thinks she's too low. Oof. That's the third mistake we've seen at number 11, which yeah. surprises me. It's not that... It didn't feel to me like that difficult to control sight. The, the visibility is maybe the best in the whole course just before when you have this green uh, striped area there. After that, the visibility is really great uh, all the way from this one hill to the other. So it surprises me, but maybe... Uh, they see the controls afterwards coming and see that it's very technical and put some focus on this one and forget to do the job all the way to control 11. Uh, that's like the only thing I can imagine. And now she should see the cliff there. Of course, the control is not very easy to see because it's behind the, or it's in this green part there. So if you if you're close but you don't know exactly where you are and you're not sure about your precise position, then it's hard to see the control. But, but I'd say that the big shape of the re-entrant is quite clear to see. Yeah, but she, I mean, if she thinks that she is somewhere else, then you could, mm. like, imagine that you are uh, there as well. But in my opinion, if she's unsecure there in the beginning, go up again, back to the track, and then attack the control again. Um, because then she might have lost 25, 30 seconds. Now I think it was more than a minute. Yeah, that's disappointing to see from Olsen, especially as she was um, neck and neck with Hauswit. Yeah, and you see the tail is 60 seconds. This She was really close to Hauswit before, and now it's two and a half minutes maybe. But this Never. is Hasrit through uh, the arena passage. And you can see there the control that we get the time from is control 16. And two and a half minute lead. And she'll have no idea that uh, Carolyn Olsen starting quite close behind her will has made that mistake. Neither will she know Eleanor Ross making a mistake to control number two. We also see that she was able to run away from Elenka Mechlova. Punched uh, 34 seconds behind Hauswirt, so she lost quite a lot of time in this uh, actually quite fast area and the uh, easy area just after control 13. And now we are waiting for Karin Ulsson. We've just seen uh, Alexandra Hornick take a new lead. 12 seconds, I think, faster than Megan Carter Davies. But here at the finish, it looks like it's going to be another new leader. Alexandra Hornick will not be sitting for very long on the leader's chair as Isia Basse now comes in. Showing that, uh, well, may not be a, a bronze medal winning performance, but she's still got some good form over this middle distance. Her orienteering looks very strong, and she's going to set a new leading time at the finish. So, new best time here for the French woman 43 35, 30 seconds uh, faster than the pole. Meanwhile, at the start, live pictures here from the start, as Natalia Gempela is about to head out into the forest. She is the defending champion. 
where she took uh, her first ever uh, world title. Individual. Individual world title. Thank you very much. Um, and I expect her to do much better than she did the day before yesterday. Um, was, was not really her race there. Let's see how oh, she is handling the direction here. Sabina Hauswirt running up here. She seems to have control. She also gets some help there by another runner in front of her. That helps a lot. Good feedback. Now I think we have seen the other runner punching the control. And once you're here and see this re-entrant, it's very clear where the control uh, should be. But it's it's a bit... I mean, you come from from below and you go up the hill and then it gets a bit more flat. So you don't really see the re-entrant uh, until you're there. So it's a bit tricky, but as I said before, you should miss more than some seconds there if you do some mistakes. It's not the place where you lose minutes. So uh, Maya Antonin here, and look, I think the runner ahead of her is uh, Susan Lersch from Germany. So caught up uh, the two minutes there. And now uh, approaches the control. Just got to check the direction out of the control to number eight. goes third. So still touching distance of Sabina Halsterit. And now a uh, silver medalist from the long distance. It was her first top 10 individual performance and she got the medal, first ever uh, individual medal at the World Championships. And she will of course gain a lot of confidence from that performance that hopefully she will be able to put into um, the middle distance today. Now we're looking at Abasold here. She is uh, pre-warned to control number seven. Mm -hmm. And she takes the lead there early against Hauswirt. Seems to have a really good start here. Very confident, attacking the control straight on the line. Going down a bit much there in my opinion, mm -hmm. but still um, I mean, she didn't. If if she does it by purpose, then it's not a big time loss. Loss. It's more about if you have wrong direction and uh, you're not really aware of it and have to relocate, that you lose a lot of time. Of course, it will cost her three, four, five seconds, but uh, that's not a big problem as long as you have control over the map reading. But from the speed that looked like she was going on the GPS, it, it looked like she was in control of that. Yeah. Um, so you didn't see any hesitations and uh, obvious looking like she had to correct. And I mean, she's uh, 35 seconds faster, so uh, it's not very slow. <laughs> okay, now we are looking at Sabina Hauswitz all the way to the finish. And look at that gap. The gap has grown again. It was about... 2.37, I think, when she passed through the arena. I think she's had a great last loop here, and now she's got to fight all the way. She knows she's got a comparatively early start compared to um, her ambitions for what she wants out of this middle distance race, so hers will be a time to beat. She may well be on the leader's chair for a while. But she did a good race all the way. I think she's very aware of that. You see that also when you see her fighting her all the way. Uh, it's not the face you have when you did uh, like an average race. It's really, it seems that she's quite satisfied with it and uh, trying to fight for every second. And I mean, she takes a clear lead here over the bronze medalist from last year. Three minutes, 27 seconds. Yeah, impressive. And don't forget uh, Lenka Meklova. Uh, was caught by Sabine Hauswirt, has a chance to get the second place here in a few seconds. Van the Haie though here, and she's on her way to number seven. This is one of the nicest parts of the course in terms of runnability, certainly. Yeah, and now you also get a track here, so <laughs> makes it even faster. Yeah, with a lot of the men's 
controls being similar, especially like on this TV leg, as you might say he here, then that's for the last uh, men starting later on the, this afternoon, it will only get more and more tracked up. She goes second. Between, between the two Swiss runners. And we actually just saw Lenka Meklova into new second fastest time, as you said. And I got to Haskin Nordberg next to start. She didn't run the long distance. Very experienced runner. This is Kat Taylor. In picture, but the athlete we're mostly looking for is Denisa Kosova, who has been pre warmed in a good time. See, um, she's running pretty consistently compared to uh, the lead, which at the first split is Simona Abersold. And they've gone quite far left here on this direction to 13, which uh, we think is a good choice. But they, you avoid the worst of the open area. Yeah, already from out of the control, you have a small track in the terrain where you can follow. I don't know if it's an animal track or if it's from runners before. I have no idea if there have been many, like the cameraman <laughs> training, I don't know. But there is a small track you can follow and it leads you automatically a little bit to the left. Uh, and when you're there, then it's just to continue on this, on this way and then you can avoid the most bushy parts here. Kind of the same problems here as we have seen uh, Sabina Hauswirt having, but uh, only two or three seconds hesitating, so no problems at all. Um, Kosova punching into second, 16 seconds behind Hauswirt. The first TV control, it was five seconds. The difference is different, so she lost uh, 11 seconds here on the second part. Czech runners having the uh, really great uh, performances so far. Here, though, is uh, the gold medalist from two days ago, Tova Alexanderson, of course, the, uh, I think, favourite every single time she starts now. Although, uh, who can forget the middle distance last year where uh, pretty much she had a, a nightmare of a run uh, and just completely making a massive mistake to some of the early controls. Let's see how she's going. Let's see how we've got Marika Taney in this group as well. Mm, and that's what I said earlier. If you, When uh, Lena Rules was starting, if you go to the left, you have to do it from the beginning. But she seems to lose a lot of time here, the European champion in the middle distance. So that's a minute. A minute she's behind there, um, rounding the green area. Yeah, it looks quite slow uh, heading up the cliff and then also in this semi-open area at the top of the hill. Or as soon as you get up to the top of that hill, that slope and losing time there. And then also choosing to go round into uh, control number five. This is number six. Yeah, and she, she lost almost a minute early in the race. Yeah, you can see already behind the time of the leaders. I mean, it will be very difficult to turn this around in this second part. You have some more controls left, which are technically demanding, but we also seen that there were no very big problems for Sabina Hauswirt in the end. So it's hard to see that she will turn this around again. Of course, she's very good. Uh, European champion, she is always up there in... Uh, and the yeah, silver medalist from last year's walk. Yeah, and she had the fourth place in, in the long distance as well. But 
I mean, Sabina Hauswert was good in the long distance as well, with the fifth place, I think. So it's, I mean, it's, it's you compare her to another runner, which is world class and very much expected to be up there and to turn around one minute, it's, it's quite much. But because it was a route choice mistake rather than a navigation, like a, you know, execution mistake do you think she will have that feedback about how well she's doing uh, no she won't but she might yeah it depends a little bit i mean if she really planned to stay so much to the left and not really go all, all the way around when she came came on this plateau on the way to control four uh, then she won't have that feedback but if she didn't really go as she planned, then she knows that she lost some seconds at least, and then she ha she will have that feeling with her. Yes, yeah, so we just saw Camilla Olasen start another of the heat winners. Uh, she had quite a disappointing performance at the long distance with a 13th place, considering you know last year uh, she had as a top five in every single Forest World Cup race. So big hopes for her. Let's have a look at Anderson mistaken yeah. to number two. She loses quite many seconds here on the first two control compared to Simona Aperson. Grounding quite much there, losing. Yeah, now it's almost a minute compared to the. Young Swiss runner, Ooh. and then staying down there too long. I mean, oh, and then Ooh. doing a mistake to the control. So it's one and a half minutes, and one more mistake there. Yeah, that's too much. She, we will have to count her out of the medal race. Um, I mean, the problem is that we already have Hauswirt in the finish without very big mistakes, and I'm sure we will have uh, two other runners without big mistakes uh, in the end of the race. So I think we have to counter out of the medal race at least. Okay, so Carolyn Olsen now into the finish. And you can see there she's already behind the time of Hauswert, uh, running alongside Eleanor Ross as well, who I think she's caught up. Yes. So. The, the Swiss will be four minutes down. So, Carolyn Olsen here into the finish. And really, really pushing hard. She is a very quick runner. Yeah, I mean, her feeling will be that she caught Elena Ruz, who is one other very strong runner. Uh, she doesn't know anything about, okay, she did a big mistake there at control 11. Um, but that's something I like about her, even if she did a big mistake, she she's always fighting for every place here. Um, but it's too much as well for her. She won't be satisfied with that race, you can see that here. Compared to two Swiss runners here, Appersold, in my opinion, a bit much to the left there, just when she left the control, but still looks good, fighting through the green to control 10. Let's see how she tackles control 11. First hill, second hill, and the same mistake as the others. Not, uh, not as bad as the others, but still that's 20, 25 seconds. Again, let's compare Simona Abersold and Lina Strand here. They have uh, approximately the same speed in the beginning, same route choices. It's faster there to be glued on the line to control four. So advantage Abersold in the very beginning. Uh, Strand with a better direction to control six, catching some seconds back, but still five to 10 seconds. But we've seen uh, Abersol doing a mistake later on, so that might uh, open the window again for the runners behind. Yeah, it's a small miss, but you know, pretty good. And Lina Strand is the silver medalist from two days ago. So uh, we saw there she had really great pace. Um, it was 16 seconds down, but... Of course, she will have a great self-confidence. She got uh, 
She said before the World Championships that she is in the shape of her life and when you get the feedback, okay, yeah, and this shape is enough to win a silver medal in the long distance, then he will start with a lot of self-confidence into this middle distance final. So it goes second and the gap is eight seconds behind uh, Simona Abersold. Yeah, as you said, did make a small mistake to control number 11. It seemed that she was uh, checking the control number very carefully there. I don't know if she was... Often when you have it that you check the control description in a championship, uh, you're a bit unsure if you're right, because, I mean, there are not many controls out there, so if you if you're on the way you planned and see the control, then you don't really have to at least check the control number. It's something else if you, uh, before the control, check the control descriptions to see where the control is located and what, what the feature is. But if you do it uh, at the control, often is a sign that you're not 100% sure. So despite that mistake, Abersol goes fastest by a minute and a half. Mayor Anton in there, who uh, Abersol has caught up, goes into fourth place. So, but I think it just, like, the way you can see from the tracking that Abasol was able to pick her way, particularly at the top of the hill from nine to 10 through the green and the semi-open, that um, she just had a really, really high speed and just really relentless through that yeah. part. I mean, she won a medal in the long distance. She won a medal at the European Champs. She is a very fast orienteer and uh, she has obviously great self-confidence and she knows it's a good thing to know that the speed I have is enough to win a medal and then you can shift the focus from the speed to the technique and as long as she, as she is doing uh, a good race technically, uh, she knows that she will be at least in top six uh, and that helps of course and she had a good start, okay she did a small mistake there but you have to try to switch back and uh, be focused again and then... Uh and it just shows that she's one of those athletes that's been able to make the transition from junior to senior, uh, you know, pretty amazingly. Uh, yeah. she, she is an exceptional junior, of course. Um, she uh, did that uh, shockingly fast. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's the same with Casper Foster. It's very impressive to see that they can just continue racing at the same level as they were doing as a junior when they come to the to the elite and I mean they usually you are a bit you get the tendency that you have to overpace you have to be, you get the feeling that you have to run faster because it's another they, they are world class, class runners and they have to do more than I did before but it seems that they understood that okay there's no reason why I should go faster than I actually can and uh, when you do that and you are in a super talent as a junior you will be quite high up then it's another thing being in the medal places and that's just amazing yeah I mean so many juniors are unable to make that transition as you said and yeah but uh, it's also very unusual that you're physically there uh, in to be in the race to actually compete for the medals that's I mean I don't know how you do that, otherwise I would have done it as well. <laughs> so, Alexanderson here, uh, one of the heat winners, and of course, uh, probably still the favorite for this race. It is quite tough, it is quite physical, and we know she has speed to, to match many of the top men through uh, the terrain and the navigation as well. But she is, she was behind Abersold. This is the last few strides into the control. And it's going to be close to the Swiss. So Alexanderson goes second. But it's a bit the same for her. She had just has to do her job. I don't know if she was checking the map all the way. If she had, uh, if she took uh, uh, like a glimpse at the end of the course, because then she could know that if, as long as if I do, I do my job here, then I can speed up in the very end. But let's look. Well, it's clearer that she's here. faster than Abersold, but that, I think, lost the time from making the route choice to control number four. Yeah, but the surprise for me here is that House Berry is one minute behind the two. I expected her to be much closer to uh, those two runners, at least in the beginning. Yeah, and those are the standings. 
Aversol still leading. We still have uh, Camilla Olarsson and Cecilia Fieber Klusner yet to reach that first split. It looks like Kosovo, it is. And a fantastic run here. We see that she's compared to Simona Aversol that control 15, so that's why she was two minutes behind there and very much closer in the end. Yeah, that the, the last ones compared to Hauswitt. The gap between Hauswitt and Kosovo was 26 seconds at control 16 at the arena passage. And again, really fighting hard. You can tell she's had a great run with uh, all the cameras, all the focus on her and her teammates are here at the finish for Dilla Hodzicka as well to uh, debrief, congratulate. But yeah, second place there for Denise Kosova. Fantastic results so far. Let's see here, Camilla Olausen compared to, to Alexanderson. See that uh, Alexanderson had a good race here. Maybe not the fastest route to control four. We have seen runners taking, but compared to Marika Taini, she's going all the way up, staying on this plateau there, and then uh, attacking the control from there. I think uh, well, I if you a minute on that leg, if you go to the left, you have to do it as Alexanderson was doing. But still, I think that's not the very best route. So. Um, it shows us that the speed she has, uh, again, is uh, great. And Olausen lost a lot of time there. Yeah, she lost time on the route choice. Well, the choice itself, first of all, and then executing it going, once she'd chosen to go left, didn't go straight on, you know, what would be the new line going left. And then I think even a little bit hesitant around control number five. But here we are at the finish. No, we're not at the finish, we're at the arena run through. <laughs> Sorry. And um, we can have a look and see, we can compare Abersol to Hauswitz, and she is still uh, running away from her Swiss teammate. Mm -hmm. She's Good. gone through the arena and back out into the terrain. It's like nine minutes left from there. Let's say uh, seven minutes left from there. So uh, just a short loop. Um, and if she can, if she gets through this last loop without a mistake, uh, I see a big chance there for her to get at least the top six, uh, maybe even a medal again. Mm, I think it could be very easily possible. Here's Marie Katani. Let's not forget she did a mistake at Control 11. Yeah, it wasn't a clean run. It was only a small mistake by, by what we've seen a lot of others making much bigger mistakes at Control uh, 11. Marika Taini was one minute and three seconds behind Abersol at the first TV control. So she lost some time here. And this is after the mistake uh, Abersol was doing. Cecilia Fieber Klusner, the last starter. Won her heat, the Dane. And now going through here, will be in the top 10. It's perhaps a surprising performance for her to win her heat, although uh, a good sprinter in the past, but still um, 54 seconds down at this point in the top 10, pretty good. Uh, well, in my opinion, uh, that's pretty good, but I don't know exactly about her shape or her expectations. So uh, yep. I would say that's a good start. Uh, if she, I hope for her that she is not expecting to uh, to win uh, like after after mm -hmm. one good race. But I don't know about her shape. Uh, I hope she would be happy with the top ten as well. Mm. So that's uh, with Klusner through. Those are the standings um, with all the runners having got through that point. Aversold, uh, who is on the final loop of the course, is leading by three seconds ahead of Tova Alexanderson. But we can see by the GPS tracking Tova's speed being very, very strong. 
So let's have a look now at some of the tracks. See, we see here that Kempele lost quite a lot of time in the beginning. We also see Taini one minute behind here. Uh, this is the part that I really liked the way Abrisal was running to control 10. Uh, attacking straight there. Also 11 in a big extent, but not all the way. When she was missing around 20 seconds there, Simona Abrisal. Here we, ha we have Natalia Kempele. She's going down and more straight, more to the right. Um, I, I wouldn't do that. <laughs> no, it's really rough there. And she's running, running with uh, Marianne Anderson and Evely Kasaku as well. Now this is as we hopefully we can. Oh no, we can't. We're not going to follow her through here. But maybe I, I mean, if you go down there, it might be good to go all the way down as she was doing and stay below the hill there to avoid this. Uh, semi-open area up here. Oh, we're going to see them crashing through below the camera. And Pelleshi was 135 behind at the first TV control. Hmm, I think she's... Mm, the feeling is that she's a bit closer if she doesn't lose time on this leg here. Here she is approaching from below. Uh, no, she just has to go up a bit closer to the camera and then it would lead her directly to the control. So I think maybe... But she caught, let's say, 17 seconds. But of course we had the mistake by Simon Abersal there, just before this control. And here she is on the way to the last control. So Simona Abersal here. Last part of this course for her. And another very good run by the young Swiss runner. As, see. I, as I said before, maybe another top six, maybe even... Uh, I, I'm, I'm not really sure it will, if it will be good enough for a medal, but of course it was a very good run. Uh, except for Control 11. If she would have uh, caught this or hit that control 11 without problems. I would say this could be a medal race, but now I don't really dare to do that. Uh, since we have uh, other quite fast runners uh, to come with Ben Vaharyun and uh, Lina Strand and uh, Tuve Alexanderson. Uh, but let's see. So Abersold here through into the finish. Will it be another nervous wait for her, similar to the long distance where she also had a a comparatively early start, but teammate Hazard is standing and applauding the youngster as she goes all the way to the line and takes an impressive new leading time here. 38-25, the first to go under 40 minutes. And, well, the gap's big compared to her teammate Hazard. We will have to wait. She will have to wait for a while. She is still leading around all of the uh, split uh, controls, all of our radio controls, where we see the runners coming through, but oh, absolutely collapsed on the line there. May Rantanen now is also going into the finish. Uh, yeah, uh, again, back to Simona Abrasol. It's very impressive to see how how she can like deliver on such a high level all the time. I don't really remember a race where she was really, really bad, at least not a champion. Okay, she hasn't been around at so many championships, but still uh, European champs and now the world champs in every race she was there and fighting for uh, the medals. Well, if you know how to be a, a championship performer, 
and if you have the mental strength to be able to get it right at the championships, that's what some of the runners who who you know are very fast about are lacking. Yeah, the ability to mentally put together a great race. As of Rassen course, but she didn't really have a lot of time to build that up. I mean, okay, she had it as a junior. That's a different thing, and she had that's her second championship. So. Where does she take it from, this self-confidence that she just wants to be there and is there? So we're having a look at Abbasolt and Alexanderson. Alexanderson going a bit straighter, but the two of them very close together. Lena Strand just, uh, I think, falling off the back of the two tails. Abbasolt still looking faster. Mm, that's what I said when she was going straight through the green there. That looked very good and very confident. Uh, we know, though, that Abbasol is going to do a mistake here. Here, I don't expect Alexanderson to do it that, but I wouldn't say that too early because she is doing exactly oh. the same. It looks oh. looks as if they, they were running together. Have, yeah, it does. Okay, so I will never do any prognosis again. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be so tight then between Alexanderson and between Abbasol. Abbasol went further to the right. If I remember. Um, the big advantage uh, Alexanderson has now is that she's together with uh, Hauskin Nurberg and uh, that will help her. I don't know how long they will keep together. Um, that's one of the reasons I wouldn't like to go up there. It's very bushy and many fallen trees. This will be a very exciting last part of the course. See, there's Haskin Nubek and uh, Alexanderson in the background. Yeah, it's really tough. You can see everything getting in the way. Uh, the visibility is a bit lower as well. My feeling is that there are some seconds ahead now. Now you see Alexanderson stays a bit lower, which is a bit better. And there. Uh, now Alexanderson takes the lead, three seconds in it. <laughs> and I mean now they come into this area where it's very fast and you have to push very hard and then it, for sure it's an advantage to be two runners. So Van Lahar you here and uh, she's going all the way into the finish. Looks like she will probably ooh, just go ahead of Sabina Hauser. It's going to be quite close actually in the end, but the Finn going all the way to the line will sneak into second place there. So just three seconds faster than the Swiss, splitting those two Swiss runners there. And um, yeah, that's a pretty impressive performance that I would say at this point will probably get her on the podium. If not, or uh, just thinking where Natalia Gempel is also doing, being pre-warned. Yeah, we have still Arena, so. many runners to come. We also have Lina Strand. Uh, this is Natalia Gempler, though, here on picture. Uh, this little... Um, and it's only five seconds between Hario and Gempler. Um, when it comes to pure running speed, I would see an advantage for Gempler, actually. Uh, but, of course, there's some orienteering to do also on this last loop. Yeah, we've seen it's very easy to make a mistake in the last section. Um, even though, and, and actually, well, probably because there are fewer details on the map, it's a bit more vague. Um, it's slight, but there's like a couple of form line contours on there as well. Um, yeah, you have to switch uh, your mind from, uh, you, earlier in the race, you always got help of all the features in, uh, in the orienteering part close to the controls, which you don't get here. You have to rely very much on your direction. And now Marika Taney was so close to the control, just a little bit further right. And that's what I said. I mean, it, it, it's possible to do mistakes here, but um, you won't do big mistakes than like 15 or 20 seconds. But in the end, I mean, but 15, uh, 20 seconds can be enough. Yeah. And now Marika Taney heads towards this greener section. Controls 18, then 19. Very short, we see her uh, on her way to the finish. She's a European uh, middle distance champion. But lost time early in the course. And again, too. Now let's have a look. Mm -hmm. And here we see they chose the same entrance to the control. Oh, it's 
Oh, Ooh. Alexanderson got stuck there in the green. So, uh, the slightly different route choice there. So now it's Alexanderson in the lead again. Oh, this oh. is really head to head here. Oh, this is so close. Yeah, look at that. So Great that's live together. with Alexanderson. And uh, Simone is actually having an interview at the moment, so she can't see what is going on. Here's Lena Strand, though. Yeah. Mm, Lina Strand, 153 behind, uh, earlier at control 13, it was 127, 124 compared to Abersolt, so she lost some time here, I don't think she, she got very much uh, liquid there, <laughs> she missed almost everything. But still, of course, she is in the fight for at least the top six, maybe even uh, the medals. I mean, Vela uh, Harju, the gap is 28 seconds. Natalia Gempele, 23 seconds. So with a very, very fast uh, last loop. It is possible. Here, though, to the finish, Marie Kataini not quite been her day to day and normally considered a middle distance specialist but I'm pretty sure her result in the long two days ago will be better than her result here today in this middle losing uh, small amounts of time throughout the course yeah. and even more interesting in a few seconds I think we have to expect or we can expect Alexanderson to the arena then it's really about maybe the gold medal. I, th I think it is. I think it is about the gold medal and it'll be Abersold versus Alexanderson, Switzerland versus Sweden. But Marika Taney into the finish here. And I have a feeling this is at the face of somebody running who knows they haven't had the best run, best, not done the best orienteering. Meanwhile, Abbasold has to do more and more interviews. All right, and now I think it's good for Alexanderson to have uh, Hauske Nuremberg, who is going up there, making, uh, setting the pace, and we see that she is 10 seconds behind. But now she's going to get the feedback from being in the arena, from hearing the arena speaker, and she will know exactly the gap. Look at that, she was pacing up directly. And that, of course, is a big advantage, but still, I mean, you had the qualification, so it's uh, an advantage that she was uh, doing some work for. It's not only uh, a random thing with the lottery for the starting order here, it's uh, if uh, Abersol would have run better in the qualification, she would have had this advantage. That's very true. Uh, so, Alexanderson and Haskin Nilbert still together. The Norwegian just going that, taking the lead through there. And then the two of them will probably be working together on this final stretch of the course. Yeah, let's hope for them that they are doing that. But uh, you don't know if they have the same thinking about that. Uh, maybe they're not trusting each other in the matter that I, both of them will want to do to say uh, their own race. And but of course, four eyes see more than two eyes. So now let's uh, have that's a look. Smart. We see that Abasol stayed longer on this path, and I can tell you, it's very tough terrain there. Even if it looks uh, white and nice on the red line, it's still uh, quite high blueberries. And it's actually one of the toughest parts to just run there. Also because you know that you actually just have to run because, uh, I mean, the direction you will have uh, the open field there. The oh, now that we don't know what... Uh, we haven't seen Abersold's tracking through this part, and it looks like... I yeah. don't think that's a good choice there. I expect Alexanderson to pass here to control 17. Actually, that's really not necessary and I mean she must have been aware of that Abersolt 
Yeah, this must be a decision. I don't understand. Surely. I think, let's hope she won't lose uh, the gold medal there. So, Natalia Gempola also on her way into the finish. The defending champion, well, she won't get another gold medal this time, but she could well be on the podium. Natalia Gempola taking the run, lost some time early on, but had a pretty good route uh, after that. So we'll go all the way into the finish. Oh, it's going to be close for se joint second at the moment. In fact, that may well, with Tova Alexanderson, that sprint finish may well have got her the bronze. It was very important for her to have a good finish here. So there's uh, five runners left in the competition that could go potentially faster than Gempola. But Let's be honest, we're mostly interesting, uh, <laughs> interested in, interested in Tove Alexanderson, indeed. Mayan Anderson here fighting all the way. She's looking for a top 10, goes eighth there. Uh, and now, I mean, we have been talking about this 17th control, where it is possible to do some seconds mistake, but not uh, in a bigger extent and the eight. Well, I think, unfortunately, I have to say it, but I think this is the place where Abyssal lost the gold medal. I think so too. I mean, you can also talk about her mistake at control 11. That's more that Alex Anderson made the same mistake too. So now they have to be accurate but on this, this path and she's gone. The thing that surprises me that much is that it was a choice by Abersol to go mm -hmm. there because he had this power line before. No, there's no way that she wasn't aware of that she had that she's going around. And um, I, I actually, I'm very surprised. I don't know why she was doing that. It, for me, it's very clear that that's lower. Yeah. Leaders so round here, though, at the finish. And she's also racing for a podium position. Before this World Championship, she'd never had a top 10 individual performance. Got the silver two days ago, and now she is really chasing hard. It's not going to be enough for a medal, but should go into fifth and with uh, Alex Sanderson still to go. She should probably end up, I guess she'll end up in sixth. But now we're waiting at the last control. Second last control. Oh yeah, second last control for Alex Anderson. And the camera trying to pick her out there. We can see some runners. That's Haskin Norberg, mm. I think, which means Alex Anderson mustn't be too far away. No, but if she sees Husker Norberg here, then I think we will have uh, the gold medalist coming. But they're not together anymore. So did she make a mistake to control 18? She what they so. were they did go off in different directions though. Here, Here she, she is. is. And uh, yeah, I think that's good enough. Let's see. We got it. We should get a time here, and now it's all for the sprint. Let's have a look. Ooh. Seven seconds in the lead. It's going to be close. It's going to be close. Will it be Switzerland? Will it be Sweden? She'll have uh, Haskin Norbert to chase, but the Norwegian is running very fast. So now Switzerland versus Sweden, and uh, lots and lots of noise in the crowd here as they're going to be cheering on Alexandra. She has the advantage by going second, and she can knows it's close. She can tell that it's close between them. She also knows that she really needs to push it as Haskin Norberg is going faster than she is. So Haskin Norberg, the Norwegian, in here and uh, she could get a medal. It's going to be close. What will the Norwegian be able to do, first of all? Will she be able to get the medal here? It, it's going to be very, very tight. I think that's enough. As Norberg is that's able it. to go in here. Is it going to be a silver? Will it be will a triple she... bronze? Oh, I think she's just going to be just outside. Let's check. Let's check. She goes fourth. Oh, so close. But and we need to get over Alex Anderson. Is she going to take her second gold of the championship? Yes, it looks good for Alex Anderson, who uh, is so close to the line Ooh. and takes. She almost the, didn't make it over the line. Almost didn't make it. Drama at the end.
pushing so fast. Alex Anderson takes her second gold of the championships. How's Norberg? Fantastic sprint finish. Look, you could see just how much she was running away from Alex Anderson, but it wasn't quite enough and, in the uh, end. I mean, if we look back at the first TV control, she was one minute and 12 seconds behind there. And uh, in the finish, it's 1.47. If she would have gone uh, faster in the first part of the race, who knows what could have happened. Uh, but uh, great run again by Tuve. Uh, one mistake, exactly the same mistake as we have been seeing uh, Simona Abersol doing. And uh, as we said, Simona Abersol, she lost the gold medal on the last loop. And I don't know why. I really, that's a mystery for me. Why isn't she choosing to go straight? She I went so well straight throughout the rest of the course. Yeah. Uh, you know, picking the routes like at the top of the hill, uh, doing that really, really well. I mean, of course it's green there, of course it's bushy, but you, she knows that she was one of the last starters, or at least that there have been like 40 runners before. There must be a track through this uh, bushy area. And if you're fighting for a gold medal, there is no such uh, thing as avoiding green areas. You have just to get through it and... Uh, and, and be ready to, to take the fight. And maybe that was the difference today between uh, Alexander and Amazon. We well, see it here. Yeah. They come here. I mean, you, you see the, like the pole of the power station there. You know exactly where you are. She's very well aware of that she is going out to the track there. She's following the track. Maybe she was a bit afraid of... Uh, making a mistake of, at yeah, the end. Yeah, making a mistake in the end. But and then she's not very accurate with the direction. I mean, if she's out on the path, she should take the direction and go straight up there. She's staying too much to the left and then... I mean, there it's almost a half minute too. We must have done... Alexanderson must have done something here in the end. I don't think she quite there. had quite the right direction into 18. Oh. Yeah. Let's split up a bit here, but... It also felt that she was quite tired, Alexanderson, so there would definitely have been the chance for the episode to to take this gold medal. Mm. But she, she was not really ready for it. It felt like she was not ready to attack and take some risk to uh, win this gold medal. Maybe she would have done it if she knew that it was about the gold medal, but uh, of course you never know that. But as you said, when you, we know that she was running really good uh, on the first part when it came, uh, like when, when it was about holding direction and keeping through the green areas. And I'm kind of speechless. I don't know why, you do, why she's doing that. And two is very tired. Yeah. Let's have a look. So yeah. this is Hauske Nurberg. How and you felt here at the arena passage that she didn't give up uh, the medal here. She heard for sure that she is a bit behind, but she was uh, very much aware of that if she was fighting hard and pushing all she has to these last controls, then she can sh still catch the others. And yeah, look, how you... In fact, hang on. Kempler Both making mistake into... Yeah, a big mistake by yeah. Kempler there. And here it looked actually quite good for at least the fourth place. Kempler going well then to control 18. Um, Tauske Nordberg did, did a great last loop here. In the end it was just, just some seconds missing. I mean, uh, when we look at the arena passage there, she was... 44 seconds behind uh, Vendla Hario. In the finish, it was two seconds. And then, yeah, look, this look at these this. tracking so close together. I'm quite sure about if it would have been a mass start and all three of them would have been together, she would have taken it. Yeah, I think so. I think so too. So we don't uh, we we don't only have an uh, episode giving kind of away the gold medal in the last loop. We also have uh, Natalia Gamble who gave away the bronze medal there. 
doing a mistake up to control 17. Well, it looks like she will share the bronze. Oh yeah, sure, yeah. On, yeah. Our, on our screen here, it's, it's it comes uh, up as third yeah. and fourth, but the time is the same. So now we are waiting for the last couple of starters. We're looking out for Camilla Olarsson. She was in the 17th position at the Arena Passage. For sure not what she hoped for. And I think, yeah, she knows how that race has lost some of that urgency that we have uh, have seen. Klusner is also here. She's also behind. She's still fighting for a top 10, though. Cecilia mm -hmm. Friedberg Klusner, as I mentioned before, I think that would be a very good result for the Danish runner. Yeah, her best result on a middle distance comes from 2017, where she was 28. So a massive step up there for the Dane. But Olausen will be uh, cheered into the arena, of course, by this Norwegian crowd. Well, good mix of nations represented as the spectator races have been taking place earlier today. We also have Cecilia Freewood Klusner in two, just approaching this last control. And she's fighting for that top 10 position after qualifying fastest in the heat. Well, so too, Olausen. Both qualifying fastest in their heats, but it was the other heat winner, Alex Anderson, who was able to take it in the end. So we have uh, Cecilia Freebeck listening to the finish, and uh, indeed, it is a top 10 uh, place for her. Three minutes and seven sec seconds behind the world champion, also in the middle distance, to uh, Alexanderson. And uh, the other results, silver to Switzerland and Simona Abersold, second medal for her as well, five seconds behind. And uh, in third, we have uh, two runners, Vendla Harju from Finland and Natalia Gempele from Russia. And also then on fifth, the Norwegian Anne Margrethe Hausken Nulberg. And let's take a look at the race again. Uh, we have Tove Alexanderson running a different route here to the fourth control. I don't really think it was the fastest one. Um, so she was a little bit behind there at that point of the race. But uh, from there she went very well. Maybe Abersold with a small mistake there with the direction to control six. No uh, bigger problems. Different route choices also here. Both of them quite similar. And then here, this one I really like to see Abersold going straight. And here both of them doing a mistake to control 11. The only mistake, uh, bigger mistake from Tove Alexanderson. And from here it was really tight between the two runners all the way to the finish. Uh, I really thought uh, Abersold would have uh, a small advantage here. But she played it away on this last part to control 17. And uh, very soon we will hear some words of the new world champion in the Middle distance, Tove Alexanderson. Congratulations, Tova. Um, another gold medal here today. Um, this one a lot closer this time. Yeah, it was really, really hard. Uh, yeah, I was really fighting. <laughs> yeah, we could see that. And it was only a small gap when you came through the arena, actually in second place. How did that feel and how are you feeling on the final loop? Oh, I was so tired. I had so much lactate in my legs. So it was like, just be able to run. And I 
I knew that my only chance was to do really good orienteering because I knew that my speed wasn't that high. So I just try to focus on orienteering but still keep on running and then it was just a fight <laughs> in the end. Well, congratulations, Tova. Well done. Yeah, thanks. So again... The results of the women's race, as we've seen before, Tove Alexanderson, the new world champion in the Middle Eastens. And uh, second place to Simona Abersold, silver medal, five seconds behind. And bronze medal, shared bronze medal to Finland, Vendla Harju and Russia, Natalia Gempele. The other top six, Anne Margrethe Hausken Norberg from Norway on fifth position and Sabine Hauswirt, Switzerland on sixth position. We have the, the bronze medalist from last year in 17th position, Isia Basse. And now we will go to the flower ceremony. And again, we have the top four runners here. Shared third position to Finland For and ladies, Russia, Ben Lahariu and Natalia Gempele. The flowers will be awarded by Inge Skell, member of the parliament from the region of Östfold and from the commune of Spiedeberg. We have a shared third place. Between Vedla Harju, Finland, so here the shared Natalia third place, Vedla Harju and Natalia Kempele. Not only a very tight race for the gold medal, but also a very tight race for the bronze medal. Uh, we also had uh, Anne Margrethe Hauske-Nurberg only two seconds Vendla behind and uh, Sabine Hauske with three seconds behind the bronze medal. But here's a junior who takes her second, not a junior, <laughs> first year senior, sorry, who takes her second medal of uh, these world championships. She upgrades it this time to a silver. But taking her second gold medal, it was a lot closer this time. And you heard from the interview, she knew it was close. She was really trying to push. She didn't feel very fast. She didn't feel very strong. Of course, having the, the one, the long distance so um, convincingly two days ago, it was just fantastic. But uh, we're going to take a short break now for about 15 minutes. And we will uh, be back again with the final of the men's middle distance. See you very shortly.
Um, we have a message to the teams. The results are now put up in the team song on the protest deadline. It's 15 minutes from now. That means 16.25. 16.25 the protest time. So the results of the minutes. And we will come back with control of the men's race very soon. It's uh, Sebastian Ken Bauman of Japan who is at the start. On the 13th, 61 new competitors. Simon Stanoni of Slovenia is the leader now at the 2.4 km mark to the time of 18.13. So, so we will come back to the men with some more commercial today. Simon in Thailand and Aaron Bato, Hungary. 
followed by Pau Jorans Caeas of Spain. The second one is the Bangladeshi Nation. We have no live pictures at the moment, but we will come back soon, as soon as we have live pictures. Well, so welcome back then to the middle finals here at the World Championships in Erstfold. And uh, we just had a little break to recover from what was a dramatic women's competition where Tova Alexanderson took her second gold of the competition. This one, though, was not quite as easy for her. She was fighting with Simona Abersold all the way. Abersold, in the end, had to settle for the silver medal and we had a joint bronze. But we move now on to the men's and we will crown a new world champion. Here's the map. Yeah, and the start is quite similar as we have seen in the women's race. The, there's a small difference at the second control, so the tracks won't really help there. Um, also a different fourth control, you go higher up in the slope there, uh, further away also 5, 6, 7, 8, uh, and then you go toward the TV split, the same one we had before. Uh, quite open, so you have uh, more time in this open and uh, very nice area for your orienteering. Oh, then uh, again a longer leg uh, to control 12, first. different part than we have seen in the women's race. Uh, then down to this control, uh, where many of the women had problems actually, towards control 16, then the TV control, and exactly the same last part as we have seen in the women's race here from control 16, all the way to the finish uh, with this last loop where we have seen a lot of drama uh, in the women's race. Uh, Bear Simona Abersold uh, played away her gold medal, I would say. So uh, it looks quite easy on the map, but there is a risk uh, that you do some small mistakes uh, with the direction. So you have to be very careful. You have to be ready at control 16 to switch your running from uh, technical orienteering to high speed orienteering on the very last part. Uh, so it will be a demanding course. Um, 
to be honest, I think the women's course was a bit more difficult than the men's course. I will explain why later on when we are back on the map. Yeah, and um, the women's course, we had the winning time of about 38 minutes. Uh, the men's course is only 600 meters further than the women's and not much more climb. So I think we will get closer, if not go underneath that th expected winning time of 35 minutes. Yeah, um, I will see. I, I think we'll see times under 35 minutes. That's my, uh, my guess. But it's again, it's a, physically, it's a very tough race. We haven't, haven't we haven't seen this uh, area before. It's the part we were talking about, which is very nice to run in. Uh, also very good visibility all the way from the first to the third control. This is really nice as a runner to get into the competition. Uh, you have some time to get rid of uh, nerve, like of, of the stress feeling you get at at the start. Um, as a course planner, I don't know if I would let the runner get into the race that much. Uh, but of course, when you have the start at the arena, you have to do something to get away from it. Uh, I don't think it was the course planner's first pick to have it there. Maybe it was uh, someone else who decided that. But it offers for the runner a good possibility to get into the race and uh, get three controls. Or you can build up the speed, or you can build up self-confidence. But then, of course, when you punch control three and uh, change in the, into this more detailed area, you also have to change the, your running technique or your orienteering technique and be careful. And uh, as you said, in the women's race, you have to the main thing you have to do is to simplify to try to make it easier than it looks with all the details on the map. And here we have this control three and four, and that's uh, one of the controls. I think, there, or my feeling is that the women's control was a bit more difficult, because if you go up the slope there, uh, you have a lot of time to relocate. You, you're pressing hard, you come up there. You don't have to find the control immediately. You see this green area just in the east of the control very clearly. You have this yellow part in the southwest of the green area which helps you. It almost guides you into the control. Uh, so in my opinion this control is more about uh, picking the route, the right route choice. Uh, I would go for the red one we've seen in the women's race, that's a good choice. Don't run all the way through the green area, that's unnecessary. And then the, it's a bit the same with this second long leg. You go on top of the hill or you avoid the hill, but you get a lot of time before the control to pick up some details and, uh, and get ready to really read yourself into all the way to the control 12. My guess is that most of the runners will go on the blue route here. You pass control four. That's an area where you've been before. You know how things would look like. You can be more attacking in this part, and then you're going to top there. And up there is actually very, very beautiful and good visibility. And you have a lot of time to prepare yourself for this control. And there's the same control as we had in the women's race. This control 14 is the control that many of the runners had problems with. Actually, I think that uh, most of the runners will run exactly as the runner in the picture to the left. They will keep the height there, pass this uh, cliff there, and try to prick the control directly from a little bit above. Also, we mentioned that in the women's race, it gets a little bit more dense just when you come into the circle. So you have to be careful, but we didn't see any of the women having problems there. So I don't think it is, uh, it is a problem for the men either. Yep, so as with the women's, uh, the first 15 runners to on the start list are those who were the best 
uh, of their nation to begin with. And then the rest of, of I think, the first 16 on the men's race, because there's 61 of them starting. And then the rest finished in the top 15 in one of the three heats, with all uh, with it, the start list being set by the opposition in the heats. So the winners of each heat will go at the very end of the list. Um, any names you want to pick out? Uh, I have many names to pick out here. <laughs> uh, the first uh, big name I would pick out is uh, Milos Nikodum from the Czech Republic. Maybe not because he is one of the big favorites today, but he won the uh, World Cup race in the end of last year. Not in the best shape, had problems with injury, but still a name to have on the list. Uh, then I would go, of course, for the Swiss, Kibbutz, Kibbutz and uh, Hoopman. Gernot uh, Umsien, he was running quite good in the long distance, so also named him on the list. Florian Hovald, uh, and then especially, he didn't perform very well in the long distance, but he showed that he's in great shape anyway. Uh, Emil Svensk from uh, Sweden, and uh, Wojtek Kral, Manedali, Gustav Bergman, Olav Lundenes, Luka Bassi. I mean, <laughs> I think we, we, we can expect a tight race. And I have to say, one runner, it was about the same in the women's race, where we had one runner that surprised in the qualification. I would really like to mention this name, because uh, Jonas Vitatis Gildis, he did a great race in the qualification. She, he has actually really good results from earlier years. Uh, he came fifth in the Middle East, 2011 in France. Uh, it's some years ago, but I'm happy to see that he's back up there. At least he was in the qualification. <laughs> okay, so let's have a look at some of these uh, routes early on. We've got, we've had 12 runners through to uh, control number nine, which is where we get the first split time. And we can already see these different routes being taken uh, up the crags and through to control number four. Mm, by now, there should be some tracks there. Uh, in the men's race, actually, it's a good thing to go up this re-entrant there, where we've seen uh, both uh, Salman Kula and uh, Blumenstein going up. Uh, and that's exactly the way I would attack this control. It's we see that Salman Kula did a small mistake there. Uh, it's also good that they stay, that I would, now I'm talking about Blumenstein, that he stayed in this, op in this white area, going over the yellow area, in, in a, where it's very tight or very narrow. Uh, so you don't have to fight nice. through there, it's quite stony and it's not very nice to run in there. Uh, so I think, uh, in my opinion, Blumenstein did a great job here in the beginning. But not a big surprise, he is living in Oslo. He has been for many years, I think. So he definitely knows what to expect of this terrain. And it shows here that he knows how to do orienteering in this Norwegian forest. Compare it to Salman Kula, who has a bit more problems with both directions and also keep focus all the way. Yeah, so Blumenstein's been pre-warned in the lead and it looks like he has caught up Ivan Serokov. We saw them both come up on our pre-warning system uh, at similar times. So Bulgaria and Germany together. I think we can see them both in the back of picture, see several bodies runners in the back of the shot. So they will be going over to control number seven and then heading further this way to control number eight. I think that's where we are. And then we'll get the time at uh, control number nine. This is for Jan Blumenstein. Chased by the cameraman. have a slightly different direction to the control as you have seen in the women's race. But now this control, this leg, is exactly the same. Yep, so on their way from eight to nine. And yeah, you can see the tracks if you look on the ground, just what it uh, looks like underfoot. So of course, this is probably this is one of the nicer parts of mm. the, the terrain. And often we see that with the camera going through there. And of course, they can't be 100% sure that's the same control as it was in the women's race, so they can't just follow the tracks. But if the track leads into the direction you want to head anyway, then you, of course, follow it. I don't know, you can guess if there is a camera following you, there must be a, a split point 
at this point, and, and most of the time they will be aware that the men and the women have common controls. Where yeah, but I mean, it's a, it was a mobile camera, like a cameraman following you, so it could be a different control as well. Anyway, successfully made it to control number nine and good direction out again. So they have a different control to the women after uh, number nine, number 10, of course. No, I uh, think we are on the way to control 16. We are indeed. This is climbing up the crags just to get into this really rough, really tough open area that's that, you th that we think if you head further left on the picture there, you get into now what is further right on the picture, and it's just that little bit less bushy uh, and easier, you know, to make your way through there. We are looking here. Well, I don't. Darkness. I don't really know. Maybe by now there are some smaller tracks, so it might be a bit better to go straight. By now, uh, it's just that the, if you take the whole picture, you have this small track leading you out from the control uh, a bit to the left. So it actually invites you to round this valley a little bit and uh, avoid the green areas. So, so I think it's a good choice to do. But maybe by now the, the vegetation is not, not really the problem anymore. And from th this point, they have the same course as the women. So it really changes in its characteristics from this point. Uh, they will go and cross the golf course and then there are far fewer contours. Uh, it's, there's more line features like controls and streams, things like that, but it's still quite rough underfoot. And especially in the last part, there's lots of um, green lines for the undergrowth, which is a lot of fallen trees. Mm, I mean, if you just look, take a look at the map, it could be, if you look at this isolated, it could be somewhere in Czech Republic or in, uh, in Switzerland as well. You see here, Nicola Rio doing a mistake to the first control. That's really, really unnecessary. I mean, you have the house there. It leads you almost all the way to the control. That's just a stupid mistake. You feel too sure and confident maybe about direction and everything you you with your head you're already uh, at the second control the third control and also now it seems to me that he's not he's a bit i don't know he's taking the climb not very early. patient he's trying to go straight very doesn't Getting stuck the in the green, yeah. yeah. I mean, you when you when you are down there beside the marsh, you actually see that there is a track following it. You should be flexible in your head that you can just okay. I didn't plan that, but it seems to be very good here. And then, if you keep on the red line, I mean, you have this re-entrant leading you up there to the hill and the green area, and then you can just round it. It's very, it's almost a bit inviting to go there. So it's 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 very good uh, and very easy. But I'm sure that he will get into the race now and then uh, the, he will be less stressed and it will turn to the better for him, I hope so. So Nicola Rio, I think he's he must have um, qualified in 15th. He'll be the, the first of the automatic qualifiers in the top 15. So uh, he will be racing. Uh, you see here, he's caught up a whole group. Uh, racing guys are quite that bit slower than him in the terrain but you know he made that mistake at control number one we saw that on the on a quite a few of the women's tracks as well just um you know some race nerves as they get control number one yeah it's also that you have in the beginning you have like 700 meters pure running mm. to the till you get to the forest and i mean you have to push very hard there but you have to be ready to switch back and actually do, I mean, there are some meters orienteering, so of course you can do a mistake, but since you have the house there, the building, it's, and you should have a quite good feeling about, uh, about the distance from there, so the only thing you have to do more or less is be careful with the direction and uh, do that for like 40 meters and then you should see the control. So it's like he's running with Jakub Czepek and Sebastian Ken Bauman. And of course we are quite tough to him now, to Nicola Rio, but we also know he has good results from yeah. World Cup, so he, he shouldn't do those kind of mistakes. Yeah, we have those high expectations, yeah. so um, be this a bit critical. Nick Simonen compared to Bojan Blumenstein, both of them living in Oslo. So 
we'll see. And as if they were running together. Yeah. Yes, I really like the way they are attacking this control. Uh, Simone may be heading up into the green area. I don't think that's necessary. Uh, here he is in the colors of Ireland. It's 29 seconds behind, so I think he lost some seconds there up to the... To but this is compared four. to Bojan Blumenstein, not compared to... Oh yeah, hang on, that's who we were comparing yeah, it to. Exactly. So I think he must uh, he must have lost some some time between uh, Control 4, a few seconds between Control 4 and 6. So I, my guess is that it was when he was heading out into the green area there. So that was Control number 8. It's uh, Simonin's comeback in the forest after three years. He has been uh, competing in sprint uh, two years ago only, and then uh, not been competing last year. Now he's back. Good, good to see him back. Good for Ireland as well. I think it's quite good for uh, countries like it's very important for countries like Ireland to have uh, uh, a role model that goes out there and is actually able to catch uh, a place in the final without the special rules mm -hmm. uh, and uh, just to see that actually it's it's possible for us as well to to get a place in the final not only in the sprints but also in the forest. And very close there to number nine. I feel like he just drifted a bit too far right of the line, judging from the uh, angle that he came in, although the, the camera has moved, so it's uh, maybe a little bit more difficult. I think the camera has moved, any so maybe a bit more difficult for um, uh, us to see. Now we're looking at, at Aaron Bako. Hungarian. Just losing some seconds all the time. S feels that he is like running a bit with the handbrake on. Handbrake on. Not really. He doesn't seem. He doesn't seem to dare to attack as much as Blumenstein is. But that can also be a difference in that uh, Blumenstein is actually living in Norway. He knows exactly how to tackle the terrain here. Maybe Bako getting a bit stuck in the green, not going directly up the re-entry in the same way as the German. Still, I, th I think that's a good route choice to do it like that. Is he missing uh, the yes. there? I mean, you should stay in this re-entrant where the yellow uh, area is going up, and then you just it leads you to this uh, spur, and then you you don't see the control from uh, from down from the yellow area, but you have to be patient and uh, try to see the spur. And when you see this, the spur is very obvious, so you just round it, and then you've, it will lead you to, to the control. And you see that d he's making direction mistakes into five, six, yeah, and seven. He's always small mistakes, and you see how much time he loses. And mm. now he's like from being some seconds behind that control four to being uh, more than two minutes behind that control seven. And this is something, I mean, especially in this area, it's not let's say very difficult in the matter that you will miss it. A lot of time there, but you have to be careful with direction and you have to do the job all the way. Otherwise, you will lose seconds with every control, as we see here. I don't fuck we're doing for Hungary. So this is control eight. Now really trying to be careful on this part. Mm. 
looks to have a good, pretty good line at, at this section. We've been, of course, in this part of the forest many times over the last uh, couple of hours. Let's have a look at this uh, second of uh, the longer legs. Mm, we see that Nicola Rio managed to get very close again. So that's what I talked about before. It's worked quite tough on him, but you see the potential he has. I mean, uh, got very close here to Blumenstein again. And the uh, difference here in the route choice. And I think if you go the way Blumenstein is going, uh, you can pass control forward there. You have been there, then you take yourself up on the hill. Uh, good visibility, you will see that small open area in the west of the control and then you can attack it very easily from there. This is Blumenstein in the picture. I think down from control 15, yes, now on the path on the road between 15 and 16. And he's heading lower down. And what a climb this They could help each other here. <laughs> Not doing it. Oh. And the Belgian Matthias Blais is choosing to go a different way. Yeah, didn't have the confidence to get up there. And this is this um, open area on the approach to control number 16. There's the German approaching very much. Uh, a lot from the south, southwest, where it's that bit rougher. Green, these younger trees. And maybe he will uh, approach the control from uh, below, lower down on the slope. Mm -hmm. The gap between Blumenstein and Jan-Erik Ness from Canada was 1.38 at the first TV control. There is the control. Too many problems, gets the punch. And then uh, down here where it, everyone's gone, but just stopping, pausing there to take in some of the detail. And at this point, do you have to kind of change tactics, change your technique? Mm -hmm. I think that was kind of the that thing he had in his mind thing. there, but still first before you change the from from this uh, technical orienteering to full speed orienteering, you actually have actually to get down on the road yeah, there, that's true. which isn't too easy. Timo Sild here um, took eighth place in the middle distance last year, fifteenth uh, on the long distance. Looking at Tim Robertson here. Yeah. The silver medalist from the sprint last year. Compared to Bojan Blumenstein from Germany. Quite similar at this point of the race. Yeah, uh, and also wins. <laughs> That's odd. Yeah, I mean, there's a risk that you head up in the wrong re-entrant, but I mean, you have to be ready for that. But it's a, it's a. But that semi-open is very obvious. It is very obvious indeed, and uh, but my, I think that he was ahead already. He felt quite sure about uh, finding the control within some seconds and was preparing the next leg or already, and then. You're not that focused, and you might miss the junction of those two re-entrants, and then it's like, and it's hard to, yeah, of course, then stupid things like those happen. So you've got to find the right balance of reading the terrain in the moment and planning ahead. Yeah, I, in my opinion, you can start either you plan when you're very when you're on a path or on a yeah on a part of the leg where you have like that time where you have time to use and and can prepare, or if you do it just before the control, you shouldn't do it until you see the control flag. Mm. But then you have to start doing it, because then you have to think about which direction you want to go out from the control, and uh, that's also a very important thing, just to get the flow into your race.
So Tim Robertson here, seventh position, 123 behind. And we're back with Nicola Rio. See, he was able to catch a lot of time compared to Boyan Blumenstein. Yeah, see, so just uh, two seconds behind that control 14, which is a pre warning control. And looking pretty good up the slope. Let's see where he will merge into this open area. Well, I could hear him before you could see him, but uh, Nicola Rio is making reasonably good progress. And yeah, there is the control. So now goes new leader at this point, 10 seconds faster than the German and uh, quite aggressive going down this slope, or at least much more aggressive than Blumenstein. Let's have a look. So let's take a look where he could turn the race to his advantage. He's keeping to the right here, going around. I think that Blumenstein would have needed to go more to the left from the beginning. Uh, the route itself looked quite similar. Small advantage for Nicola Rio. Quite, uh, it's really a head-to-head -head here in this part, but then Blumenstein stayed quite low there, heading up uh, late. I think that's where he lost uh, most of the time there. But I think it's interesting that that longer leg, the two different routes, but pretty much the same, not very much in it. As you see uh, the Czech athlete, Milos Nikodim, begin his route. As we said earlier, he uh, took a win in the middle distance in the World Cup final on home soil. The very distinctive sa um, sandstone pillar tower um, terrain that we had there. This is Matthias Grull from Austria. Didn't start in the long distance. Very direct through the terrain. Mm. Goes third. I think we are waiting for Nikola Simonian. Yep, there he is. The green and white of Ireland blending in a little bit with the. He was talking yeah. about the luck of the Irish when he took uh, the 15th. 15th uh, spot, but I think he would have made it to the final anyway as the best runner from Ireland. But interesting to see, uh, Jakub Cipek from Slovakia and Sebastian Kembaman of Japan have both managed to stick on um, Simonin and I think have gained quite a few places from that. Uh, Bauman was, uh, is still the last place at, um, you know, at the earlier split. I mean, it's a totally different thing if you just can follow a runner or if you have to do the work uh, itself by yourself. Uh, usually the runners like uh, Sebastian Baumann or uh, Jakob Čupik, they're not bad runners, but they're just not as good in changing the information they have in, like into the, and, and put it into speed. They might be a bit slower in, in this process. And if you have help of a runner like Nick Simonen, you can, uh, quite easily adapt to, to the speed, but if you had to do the job by yourself, then it's a totally, totally different thing. So the top three there, quite significantly faster than the rest at this early point. This is Artus Paulins from Latvia. Ah. 
see he's already slower than the leading time. Bayern Blumenstein from Germany still leading at this point with 25. Howlins will be the 25th runner to reach uh, this control. Control number nine, if you're also following on the tracking. Palin's just looking around him. He knows the control's close. Ah, there we go. Spots it there. Just a little bit left of the red line. You could see that he was not totally sure about his uh, very exactly. He knew that he was close, mm. maybe also because of the cameraman, <laughs> but he had to turn his head quite a lot to manage to see the control and that's a sign of uh, that he was not 100% prepared of what's coming. Here we have uh, Martin Siermais compared to Boyan Blumenstein. So Siermais has been pre-warned, obviously in a good time, because Blumenstein is still the leader mm. at number nine. And very soon we'll be able to see him through this point of the course. Very experienced runner, Martin Siermais. And didn't run the long distance. Well, he had his first World Championships back in uh, 2001. It's actually 15th time he has uh, been participating in a world championship, so that's what I call an uh, experienced runner. And here he is. Yeah, quite a good speed up here. Yep, just going over the hill into control number eight. And he'll drop down into the control just here. It's on a small marsh, three by three meters small marsh. Although it's actually been, the forest is pretty dry generally, even though there has been quite a lot of rain in the past week. Yeah, and it's a big slope here, at least in the beginning. Of course, the water won't get stuck there in this part of the race. Looks like he's caught up uh, Sebastian Indurst, the Italian, who also has Swiss nationality. Yeah, living in uh, Gothenburg. Have we been here before? Not this view. We've more followed them from the left, but this does look like going down uh, it's across me, the... It looks a bit like a mistake here. I mean, uh, it's all, it's never a good sign when the cameraman stops running. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> Here's the German though, Blumenstein, going to set a new leading time here. And may well be the first to go under 40 minutes. Uh, as it looked, it was quite a good race by Boyan Blumenstein. We, of course, we didn't see the very end of the course for him but in the beginning it looked okay of I mean for sure it won't be in the fight for the medals but it looks like a good technically a good race here this is Timo Sild from Estonia and I think this is the maybe the first runner who can uh, set a good time here let's see 38 seconds ahead at control number six And, you know, from this, these times with Blumstein already going into the 40 minutes, we can say what we, what we thought that the men's race will go faster than the women's race. Um, yeah, I'm quite sure that they will go down to under 35 minutes. So Timo Sill here, I think he's actually lost a little bit of time. He was... Over 30 seconds ahead. 
still the new leader. The Estonian goes fastest. Should maybe compare him to Nicola Rio instead. Takes the lead in the split afterwards. Here we have Sild, Siermais and Blumenstein. Good speed in the beginning for Timo Sild. Heading up too early. That's my impression. It's so much easier to stay down there. If you see the speed he has, he should have been running away from them earlier, from the other ones. Quite okay here in this part. Oh, then he did. That's, that's a really unnecessary mistake there. You should, if you run from six to seven, you should try to see the hill, the top of the hill, just above control seven. So there's no reason to run further down there. Here's Nicola Rio in the final part of the course. He's coming to the second to last control. I think he will be, uh, he will take the lead quite clearly here. So it's a pity for him that he missed in the beginning because I think that he did uh, quite a good race on this second part. We saw that he was, uh, let's say, half a minute behind. Uh, yeah, he was 20 seconds behind at the first TV control, but he did some mistakes already earlier in the race, so uh, it's a pity for him. Pretty good race otherwise. He will set the new leading time at the finish, however. Great support for him on the run-in from this crowd. And we'll take the new fastest time. We'll get to sit on the huge, great green leader's chair. As long as it doesn't rain. So Nicola Rio, that new lead. Let's have a look now at uh, Milos Nikodim. A little bit off the direction. Goes back towards the boulder. Same route, sticks a bit closer to the red line and then staying down, so now we can compare the two routes. I think it's better to stay down on the slope there. Well executed as well. Yeah. And Sild found a slightly faster way there from control four to five. But um, yeah. It's a stupid mistake there at Control 7 by the Estonian. But the Estonian was in the lead at, uh, it's still in the lead at Control number 9. So is the Czech able to go faster? Probably. Moving very fast. Okay, able to get some speed up it through this particular part of the terrain. I think he will set the new best time here. He's quite close to the control. Yeah, looking good. At this point takes a new lead by 26 seconds. Uh, carries on through the control, then a sharp left. So to recap, those are the standings at uh, split one with uh, Nikodim taking the new leading time, 14 minutes dead. Blumenstein is now second at the finish. We've got to see Nicola Rio in fifth is our current leader. A lot of people changing positions in the leaderboard. Let's see, Matthias Grull compared to Nicola Rio, both choosing to go to the right of the red line here. It seems that uh, Rio is just a bit more distinct in the orienteering. Winning second by second. This is 
the Austrian on the way from 15-16. Heading quite far left. It's quite a good choice, we think. To take this route. In fact, we haven't seen many of the men doing this, but no. he's very made a very clear decision to do so. I'm, I'm not sure if it's that much faster now. Uh, I mean, there are many runners have been running straight. Uh, there must be some tracks through this bushy area, so it might be quite good to go straight now. Uh, for sure, you shouldn't go too much to the right and uh, both get stuck in the slope and the green area. Still looking very aggressive, just checking the detail. And the fallen trees, felled trees in this area as well. And the control is just down in the re-entrant. You pretty much could see it just from the camera shot. It's really not the most enjoyable control here. <laughs> no, not at all. I think the runners will much prefer the section in the um, in the forest itself, and particularly the group of controls in the southwest. Let's look at Pavel Kubat here, his uh, track. So he loses quite many seconds in the beginning without any big reason. That's... Well, he chooses to pass both the stony and green area twice. And I mean, that's almost, yeah, almost a minute he loses there on this very short section. And then a little struggle kind of coming down off the slope as well, I think. Picking a route through the rocks. It is very rocky, I mean, as you can see from the map. So Pavel Kubat is the next we will see of picked up from the running cams, I'm sure. And the GPS is about 15 seconds, we reckon, behind real time. Here he is. Control eight. And looking fast down the slope and out into the next control. This is a nice part of the course. You can feel like you can pick up some speed. You can start feeling good. You can see he's also looking around quite a lot, checking the control description. And a change of direction and out to the next one. Goes fifth, though. Let's compare Martin Siermais and uh, Nicola Rio on different routes. Let's see, I think that uh, Rio was ahead of uh, Siermais. So it was quite the same there. Uh, in my opinion, the control is a little bit easier if you take uh, the route a bit more to the left. Because you get more time on the hill to get all the features. And now that uh, we're live with Sermes, and it should be him on his way down from Control. Oh, Sermes in the picture. Control 15.
that we have seen before. He was uh, behind Rio on the GPS. Still, still quite many meters to go to control 16. And you can tell he's using every opportunity to take a look at the map. Timo sealed here. To split number two as well, so catching up Zilmos. Also Sebastian Inderst. Who's kept pace with Zild and then fat pushing ahead at this point. And the two of them are taking the route to towards the left. Yeah, that's uh, it was it was the small track I was talking about, which leads you a bit more to the left. And if you take it from the beginning, you will. And it's quite tempting to go all the way around to the left. And we <laughs> saw that the uh, Inders made uh, a step beside, let uh, Sild go in front, taking care of the orienteering. All three of them, so it was interesting to see. Two of them more to the left. Uh, Sirmais went straight. It was quite similar. Yeah, they caught time on Sirmais, but they were looking just a lot more aggressive when they're running, particularly Timo Sil there. Let's have a look at this replay mm -hmm. as Sil took the new leading time. So that's there you can get this small marsh just before the control when you are on top of the hill. Makes it very easy to approach the 12th control. So it was about a minute there, the difference. Would have been interesting to see it all the way, to see if it was faster straight or to the left. So just about uh, five minutes ago, we had the start of Theo Lassen from Denmark. Can give you the split at this control. Nicolas Rio was 117 behind, so I think he lost around 15 seconds when he went more straight there compared to the left option Sild was taking. Now we have uh, Peter Hodgkinson compared with Timo Sild. Again, to this fourth control, both of them going up early. Just losing time all the way. There's no really visible mistake there, but it's just not really the speed that uh, Sild has. And oh, that's also. He had, uh, I think he had a bad direction out from the control. Um, but he noticed. Uh, Maybe the marsh. Quite early, oh, quite early. He noticed it at least. <laughs> yeah. Just before it was too late. But of course, that's another 20, 25 seconds. And I mean, we compared to Sild here, who also did the mistake. Mm -hmm. And he's not the leader either. No. Let's see, that's a replay. Sild and Nicodem. Coming together again. You can him just a little bit faster. Yeah. You know, I'm still not convinced there's very much between those two routes. No, choices. no, no. It's much more about the execution. E yeah. I think we just lost his track, yeah, that's why really <laughs> he hasn't stopped. Uh, Got a bit <laughs> nervous there. <laughs> no, Nikodim, well, he's been pre-warned, which means he's punch control 14. So we're going to very You're soon right. see him at uh, on the way from controls 15 to 16. I think the GPS just stopping and starting a bit there. It looks like they're hesitating, but I think it's more with the GPS replay. It's just jumping that a little bit. So looking for the check uh, runner now. And here he is at control 15. Forty seconds left to the control. That will be tight. Mm. 
He went very straight in the beginning and then had to go and take some meters on the path there. I think Might have been smart to go more to the left from the beginning. But you could see, I think, as he ran across down the path, he was looking for a good route up on those crags and spotted this one here that he's taken. So let's see how he approaches. There we go. And I think looking to tr maybe try and pick a good route through this. That's why he's going more to the right of picture. Trying to look around in the terrain for a way that's going to save him some time. Still our current leader at uh, control number nine, but you can already see his time is slower than that of Timo Sild's Estonian. Nicola Fio is still our leader. I'm not finish. really convinced by Nicodem's uh, body language here. He was not really fighting through the green. He was Taking a break, taking the terrain, and then taking the step anyway. So, I mean, this is a world championship. So it's the final. You just have to go and fight through the green. I mean, they, of course, it, it's painful, but it's it's the world championships. <laughs> we have Andreas Kibberts from Switzerland on the way to control nine. And you can see at the control six, which is the pre-warning, he was 11 seconds faster than Nikodim or whoever the fastest runner was there. I've been team race at that point, actually. Then we see another runner in front of him. That's Konstantin Serebrianitsky from Russia. So that's a uh, good feedback for the Swiss runner to catch a runner here quite in the beginning, of course even if it's not one of the medal fa favorites for the medals, but still, it's always nice to catch runners. And takes a new lead, again, by those 11 seconds. So, let's compare Sild and Kibbutz. Very similar here in the beginning. As expected, no problems so far. Both choosing almost exactly the same route here, no. Silt uh, going around on the path there, losing, let's say, five seconds, three seconds maybe. <laughs> and then Silt is heading up there into the slope quite early. Keyboard staying beneath it. Using re entrant not really. Going up there. From there, you can see the green area very clearly. Uh, so the problem itself shouldn't be a pr uh, the problem. The control itself shouldn't be a problem. You see that the difference uh, between staying beneath the slope or go up directly is maybe let's say 10 seconds. And uh, then we are talking about uh, two runners who executed the leg pretty well. Here, I think it could be a good thing to stay in this white area a bit longer uh, to, to avoid all the stony areas and open areas. Here we have uh, the bronze medalist from last year. So the only mistake I've seen from Simpson Florian so Florian Howald from Switzerland. Florian Howald at one. Watch out for... Back with Timo Sildes. This is the final loop. In fact, Timo Sildes looks to be oh, approaching the control from the north. Seems to be a mistake here. It's too much to the north here. And this, this part of the course really has 
caught people out a lot. Yeah, you can see from the, the tracking that's the mistake that he made. Um, we were chatting in the women's course. It's quite easy to get your distance there because of the catching feature with the open behind you. But it is quite tricky to get the, the direction. But I don't know, people should be doing it better than this. I mean, you should... First of all, you get into this new area. You have, been, you have had the arena passage, but then you cross the power line, uh, which is very visible. And in my opinion, you should be able to use your compass and go for direction for 150 meters without uh, ending up too much to the left. But of course, it's the end of the course. You're tired. You may be want to push uh, physically and not really technically there and it seems quite easy on the map when you take a look at it but uh, it's always a risk uh, when you don't really do the work all the way when it uh, comes to direction and it's unnecessary totally yeah because you don't do the work all the way you're you're off the bearing and then you can't it's very difficult to get back on again. I mean, it's no, it was not a very huge mistake, but no. still, he lost 10, 15 seconds there. Yeah, we're, we're being picky because this is the World Championships, you know? This, uh, these are the best runners in the world And because who it's are a, here. a nice thing to be picky when you're sitting in a chair and uh, looking at the screen. Of course, we're in the, the best position. <laughs> so, two last in there into, of course, into control number nine. And he will go third. Has a seventh place in the middle distance from the walk back in 2011. Here is Timo Sildo now to the finish. And it looks like he's going to set a new fastest time here at the arena. Something for this great crowd to cheer on. Fantastic arena we have here. He was 1.25 ahead of uh, Nicolas Rio at the Arena Passage. Lost some seconds up there at Control 20. But we don't know how the, how the others have done on this part. We saw in the women's lots of people making mistakes. Timo Sild here, the Estonian will take the new fastest time. When I was talking about that in the women's race, you could see Sabina Hauswitt when she was on the last meter. She really believed in the chance to be quite high up in the result list. And if you compare that now to Timo Sild here on the last meters, I'm quite sure that he knows that he won't end up uh, in the top six because otherwise you would have seen another Timo Sild there. So new fastest time now, 37 minutes and 12 seconds. Be pretty good. But still Here some runners run. yet to start. Oh, and another Kov is one of them. He did not succeed in the long distance, was number 36, He's but we know what he can. 147, so we've got Russia. Still got quite a few runners that yet to make their way into the terrain. World champion 2013 in Finland. Right. So in Kind of a surprise there that he won the race, and it would be quite of a surprise today as well if he would uh, take a medal. But this men's middle distance, probably the most open medal, most most number of guys who could win it. Yeah, definitely. There are many many runners who can do really really good. Uh, in the middle distance in the men's class, but still it would be a uh, big surprise for me if uh, Novikov would win the medal today. So this is Milos Nikdim, and we can see he's got a good direction to the control. If you compare that with Timo Sil, but he is slower than the Estonian. Uh, he was one minute and five seconds behind at the Arena Passage. It's less now, so let's see. Um, Maybe well, maybe like 50 seconds left, so 15 seconds that uh, Sild missed there at control 20. And of course, you'll have noticed the GPS tracking about 15 seconds slower than real time. That does give them an indication 
you know, like with Silk, about the direction that they take. And how well they're doing at this very, very last part of the course, where, you know, it's so easy to make mistakes when you're very, very tired. So now we have uh, Florian Hovald, Gernot MC and uh, Andreas Kibbutz. In the comparison here, see different route choices. See that MC went more to the left. Lost quite much time there, let's say half a minute, a bit more maybe, compared to the two Swiss runners. Were quite similar in that, or extremely similar in that uh, part of the race. They could have been running hand, hand in hand there. Yeah, so Hovald, uh, I think, is at the pre-warning, was just a bit slower than Kibbutz. But we will see him now. Here he is. As you said, defending uh, bronze medalist. Didn't run the long distance two days ago. Has never raced the long distance at a World Championships. It was actually a good part of the race for Hovald. He was some seconds behind at the pre-morning, and now he is uh, 10 seconds ahead of Andreas Kibbutz. But Milos Nikodem is here, and he's not going to take the new leading time, but he will go second. Mm, and uh, he was actually 24 seconds faster on this last loop compared to Timo Sils. Let's see here the long leg. Very different here from uh, Andreas Kibbutz. I don't think we have seen that. He went out all the way to this path, which was actually, it's a replay, not a sink. So uh, it was quite similar, actually. And yes, yeah, so we've had the, the pre-warning of him at control 14. So he's very soon going to be at control 15, especially with the little uh, delay we have on GPS. And he's looking good to set a new fastest time. Still with the Russian, actually. Yeah. Serebrenitsky. You can see there, control 14. 15 seconds in the lead. So my guess is that uh, Serebrenitsky did quite a big mistake in the beginning because now he's still in front of Kibbutz here, so he's actually not just following, so he's still active in, in the orienteering. And uh, that's, I mean, that's a good situation also for Kibbutz. And do some runners like being with somebody else or do some runners really not like it? Well, it depends. Uh, some runners, for sure, don't like it to be with others. But I think, uh, I mean, in four eyes, always see more than two eyes. So if if the other runner is not just following, what's negative with uh, being two? There's no, I mean, there's, you just don't, as long as you don't get distracted by the other runner, uh, then it's a good thing to be two runners. I think that's my opinion. You can get help with uh, the speed also. You have seen that in the women's race when we had Hauske uh, Norberg and uh, Tove Alex Andersen on the last loop. I'm sure that uh, that was an advantage also for Tove to get someone helping her with the speed. Well, there are 
the people struggling well, with the network, Gibbert went it um, to be overloaded. So if you uh, joint fastest uh, with Timo uh, Sills, here's Mika Kimmela at the start. You, you must use the Wi-Fi. So actually, uh, Timo Sild was 37 seconds faster than keyboards from TV1 to TV2. So now we have uh, Emil Svensk and Surya Leinen from Finland, Svensk from Sweden, in the comparison here. Together with Florian Hovald. And uh, as expected, Svensk has a good speed here in the beginning. Going all the way straight. I think we have seen uh, Simon Abersol doing that as well, which was quite good. This, uh, actually, this looks really good for Emil Svensk. Good start. Didn't have a very good run in the long distance, or he had a good run for most of the parts, but uh, missed both control five and six, and lost, I think, his chance for the medal there. Four and five, I think. Yeah, he made like a four minute mistake at control number five. I think he-, uh, he too, too low on the um, slope. <laughs> but here's, here he is. Yeah, you see that lead, 38 seconds at control six. That's a very good start for Emil Svensk, for sure. Ooh, he's leaving the track there. Mm. Yeah, crossing the stream at different points. This is Surya Leinen from Finland. So very soon, I think the two runners will be together. In the Svensk and Topi <laughs> Surya Leinen. Here is Svensk. Whoa. And yeah, he will get some good feedback. And now, the I mean, he will see the runner from Finland. Uh, that's an advantage now for some minutes because he can just try to get closer and closer. Of course, he has to read the map as well because there's a reason why he <laughs> catches uh, the runner from Finland. But still, you get a, you get some help, uh, especially when leaving the control and the last meters in. And uh, you can win some seconds there for sure. It's to a lesson. <laughs> From Denmark. Again, takes a few meters on the track, just trying to, again, he'll head for the, I think that same part of the crag where it's a bit easier to climb up. Not going as, I think he's probably staying quite close to the line by being on, at this point. being, I think, quite cautious at, at this point. Use the time to check the map at the top of that slope, now going through, down and up through the re-entrance. That's uh, should be Serebrenitsky, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, and uh, still ahead of Andreas Kiburts. 
It's actually taking the lead here. Seven seconds ahead of Timo Silts. If I take a look out here, the window, it seems that Serebrianitsky has quite a high speed here. I don't know if uh, Kibbutz will be able to follow here. Uh, it might change when they come back into the forest. Okay, take Kral here at the start. This was a few minutes ago. And he, we, he has picked up time. And I think, Pete, that was the, what we saw. This, uh, and Seventh place time. in the long distance. Let's see here. Let's compare Howald and Kibbutz. More or less the same route choice, but Kibbutz was choose differently right in the beginning, and it cost him a lot of time here, almost half a minute. So, yeah, that was not a good decision at all to go out on this small track there. As I said, I mean, I said that in the women's race, it's the green is not very dense, is low visibility, but you have just to go in and fight through as fast as possible, and you won't lose a lot of time there. It would be something totally different if you would have control, a, a control in the green area, but as long as you just have to pass, you, you just have to go in and fight and get your way through it. And uh, it l I mean, it looks more dense than it is. It's not. Uh, it's not. Uh, that's that kind of green you get stuck in, but it's not very comfortable to be in either. So, yeah, just take the pain and go through. That's what you have to do if you want to do well at a World Championships middle distance final, of course. I so mean, you, ca you can't say that, that there's a lot of green on this map. So uh, last year you had uh, almost a whole course in uh, kind of this green. So uh, you, have to get, you have to go through it when there is some 30 seconds the course in, the, in this green area. So Hovald on his way to control number 16 now. Got a buffer of over a minute and a half. see him out here on this clearing. Pretty good intensity. There is. Checking, using it's the opportunities to check them out. It's a bit like where's Wally. Yeah. <laughs> You're looking at the picture and try to find the red white guy in the in it. <laughs> you, yeah, where which part of the bushes is he gonna emerge from? Oh, but it's good for Herwald. That lead by 47 seconds is a good one at this stage of the competition. Mm -hmm. It was uh, 10 seconds at the first tee, so uh, it was about uh, half a minute Kibbutz lost there on this route choice. This is Mika Kim. Ah. Okay. You've got to bear in mind, Emil spent his gap over the rest of the field at that point, 36 seconds. So yeah, That's an impressive gap. Yeah. I mean, it's only 13 minutes into the race, so it's that <laughs> he, did, uh, he did a great job in the beginning. So a big group of guys coming in here and leading them will be 
the new leader at the finish, Andres Kibbutz. Well, we see that he definitely had the power in the end of the course, now in front of Serebrionitsky. Yeah, who looks like he'll go about fifth. Good speed here on the last meters. And uh, if you compare this speed and this fighting to the race before uh, Timo Silt, it's kind of a difference. Even though it was just 35 seconds between those two guys. And that feeling to be running in with a group of five there and be leading them and uh, you know, having caught them all up as well is a fantastic feeling. Wojtek Karl here also on his way through to control eight and then nine. There's number eight. And you could see by the graphic that he was already nearly a minute slower at control number six. Yeah, he must have done a mistake, either a mistake uh, at the control or a bad route choice in the beginning. Can't imagine that he loses uh, more than a minute just physically. Here we have Emil Svens compared to Hovald. Again, it's not synced, so it's hard to say which one was faster, but now it's almost a minute there. So he continues to run very well, Emil Svens. Either way, Svensk maintaining the lead. And yeah, he's been pre-warned in the lead. At, that was control 45, but he has dropped quite well. No, no, he's still uh, no, no, that's above the main part of the steep slope, so... It's exactly the route we have seen the, the pre-runner pre -runner do. doing in the video. It is. And uh, I mean, if Svens can continue like this, and let's be honest, the last part of the course is not as demanding technically as the first part. Um, well, this might be a medal race here so far. Yeah, so far so good. But I mean, he didn't make the mistake on the Vega part of the course in the long distance, where there were fewer details on the map. So, but yeah, he should be able to keep that uh, together. It does go quite far right though to this control, um, and will drop quite steeply down this slope and back up again. Maybe going to approach the control from um, lower down the slope. Yeah. Stops and has to. I think he will right. lose some seconds here, actually, but... Uh, but we have to wait and see if it's significant. Yeah. Of course. It was more than a minute at the, uh, on the GPS before, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think he will lose some seconds here. It depends on where he's coming up. Will he approach the control from above? From below, I think, maybe. Uh, he, lost, he lost some time there, that's for sure. Yeah, it was 104 oh. areas. Quite a lot of time, actually. Mm. Yeah, as I said earlier, I shouldn't do any prognosis. <laughs> <laughs> it's a commentator's curse. Yeah. It's quite some power you have as a commentator, how you can influence uh, the race here. But losing 30 seconds. Yeah, and now I would... Uh, I wouldn't be too sure anymore about the medal race because 30 seconds in... in with this uh, runners following after, it's quite a lot anyway. And Ruslan Glibov, long medal silver medalist from last year, 
goes second. Let's have a look at the routes. Yeah. Ui, Riekborn did not e exit that control well. Didn't choose the best route there either. Glebo seems to have a good speed in the forest. It's almost uh, running faster than uh, Svensk there, actually. Slightly more to the left to control five. Still, they are almost together. Riekborn just losing time all the way. It's... Uh, Proves that both Glebov and Svensk had great speed there. Yeah, Regborn went eighth at uh, control number nine. As Tio Lassen finishes, he goes fourth. Here, though, Daniel Hubman started a few minutes ago and. Um, can he take another medal in these World Championships? Bronze medal, just four seconds, three, no. four seconds ahead of his teammates. Statistics says no, since it's the second race. <laughs> he takes a medal every second race, so. <laughs> yeah, I think he has like, well, it was before this. It's slightly before this more World than Championships at 55% yeah. medal no, it's slightly, rate. slightly more than 50%, uh, 50 well, so there's actually a chance that he will get a medal today as well. <laughs> Okay, these are though the standings at the finish. Uh, Andreas Kibbutz still the leader. And yeah, we just saw two Lassen in there. But let's have a look at what, oh goodness me. Oh, oh, he okay, hasn't been on. at control, control 11, 11 yet. Well, that's, oh, he had a really bad direction out of control 10. And kept going for a long way as yeah. well. He was at, um, Seventh at control number nine. Here we this are. Is Hovald. In Hovald, still ahead of Kibbutz. It was uh, 41 seconds at the Arena Passage. I have a feeling it's a little bit less yeah. than that now, despite from the GPS tracking. Uh, Kibbutz had quite a group there with him, mm. or at least uh, the Russian runner in the beginning. And others to chase as well. Yeah. So, yeah, it might be less than 30 seconds now. Imsen caught up two minutes. But here is the uh, at the Sweden. start. Again, also this was about, about three minutes ago. This start has good form, very disappointed in his race. He struggles to put together a race at uh, the World Championships. Mm, he, uh, just after the race, he was complaining about his shape, actually, but he had to take it back after <laughs> doing the anal analysis of the course because it wasn't the shape to blame. It was actually the choices that uh, made it impossible for him to fight for the medals. And now we're again with Florian Hovald on the last meters. Yeah, this is the second to last control he's just looking for now. Uh, he seems to be very tired here in the end. We have seen uh, Gennot Imsin passing already. About one minute to go, let's see. It's, it's possible, but it's going to be tight anyway. You see that he lost here about 10 seconds just from control 21 to Control 23. And Hovald comes into the finish just as uh, Emil Svensk passes through the arena passage with a, a leading time. So, punches the control here. It's cheered on all the way around. Fighting hard, but very tired. We've seen 
Gurner Imsen cross the line just now. Really trying to fight all the way. And he will go fastest, yeah, only by eight seconds. And he lost almost half a minute here on the last part of the race. So either he was very tired or he did a small mistake in the end here. He has already won gold medal this and week. Uh, this was uh, a couple of minutes ago. The six times Olaf world champion for the long Lundanes distance, Norway. Olaf Lundenes is now about to start his race again. He has to be a favorite in this middle distance, but not quite so much favorite as in the long. He absolutely shot out of the start line. It was really impressive when we saw him sprinting towards us from the commentary position, really, really attacking this first part of the course. And uh, yeah, impressive. In the picture, you have uh, Thomas Spieder, former world champion and the long distance, no 2003 winner, in Switzerland. And, his brother and now we're live with day. the final starter. Comes Topi the from the other heat winners, of course, Matthias Kibert, just edged out into fourth place, really start. trying to psych himself yep. up on the start with only a couple of seconds before his middle distance final will get underway. He's really trying to take it all in, really trying to get into that race mode and attack this course. He was, as I said, a heat winner, fourth place two days ago. And proved that even though with some injuries this year after the test races, still has a good shape and he is one of the fastest still in the field. He was running on the painkillers at the long distance. So still not totally recovered from the injury. Ooh, tests. A uh, mistake here by Svens. We can tell you that at the Arena Passage he was leading 58 seconds ahead of Florian Hovall. But here again, small mistake in the very end. This course, let's say, if we include the hesitating, 10 to 15 seconds. And I don't think this will, oh, this won't affect his lead when he comes into the finish, unless he makes any more mistakes, but. It's all those faster guys. Yeah, but we have seen he lost uh, like half a minute earlier to control 16 and now again 15 seconds. Mm -hmm. For sure he did a good race, but will it be enough with uh, 45 seconds mistake in the middle distance to get a medal? I don't know. We have to wait. I mean, we have still great names out there to come. This uh, is Alexi Niemi from Finland. He's also lost some time. Yeah. It's quite a lot already in the beginning. That's, even with the you know mistakes you've seen from Emma Spence, it's uh, well you can't really catch up time. You can only lose more really, as we've discussed. So that was control number eight for Alexi Niemi, who's not run the long. He was 17th in the World Championships last year uh, in the middle distance. So Niemi's going to be a little bit to the left of the line, just having to check and look around. He's found the control now and looking to the next one, of course. It's a good direction change. And now here is Emil Svensk. And he has the lead. He will take the lead, but he will have a nervous wait to see if it's going to be enough. He's made, he has made a couple of mistakes in there. Nothing like what we saw in the long distance. Nothing like it. We know he has good form from the spring. We know he's got good speed, but it will be a nervous wait for Emil Svensk, who does take the new leading time at the finish. He did look very fast in the run-in. Goes 34-48, so first one under 35 minutes under, uh, under the winning time, as we uh, thought. Let's have a little look, though, uh, with him compared to Hubman. Yeah, Hubman must have done a mistake here in the beginning, or at least a bad choice. So, um, But let's get back to Svensk. Uh, 
If he wouldn't have lost that much time to control 16, I would say that's a medal race. No, it's... I mean, for sure it was a good race and you could see in what a great shape he is. But is it enough, really? 45 seconds on, on this course? Uh, I mean, look at uh, the difference here between Svensk and Hoopman. It's, it's... It's really... I mean... Koopman won't beat uh, Svensk here, he's al already 140 behind, uh, 45 seconds mistake by, by Svensk, but nothing more. I mean, it, beside those 45 seconds, he did a great race, Svensk, so... Uh, yeah, it will be... Uh, it's still... There's still a possibility that it could be at least a medal race. That's... Uh, I... I w I don't think it's a gold race, but it's for me it's definitely a top six race and maybe even a medal race. Well, he's just trying to get on some fluids in front of us and doesn't look the happiest. Keeps shaking his head, having a good uh, debrief with the coaches, not looking, um, uh, not looking 100% pleased with his race. And I mean. You know, there are there were a lot of mistakes there. Yeah, the problem is that he knows that he has done mm. uh, 45 <laughs> seconds of a mistake. Mm. Uh, he knows that he could have done better. That's yeah. that's the most frustrating thing when you uh, when you feel it in your, this, your especially when you know that you're in such a great shape. Then it's it's kind of uh, unnecessary. I don't know. I mean, it was not the mistake at least at control uh, 16 was not because of overpacing. It's it's. It's kind of a difficult control there because you don't really know how to tackle it. But here's someone who could therefore be challenging Svensk. He's only 22 seconds behind uh, at that point. Definitely. And in the picture, we have Magnodali from Norway, 41 seconds behind. Still uh, a chance for him as well. Seriously, Glubov at that point, four seconds slower than Svensk. We missed him coming through at that point. We shouldn't forget, I mean, Glubov was 22 seconds behind. And that was actually after the biggest mistake of Svensk. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So Svensk definitely has a better speed. I mean, you can see that here. He's just 10 seconds ahead when they actually start with the, with the course. Let's look at oh, Berman and Daly. That's again not the best route choice here. But he's keeping it together quite well anyway. Loses less time than I expected. But imagine uh, if Berman once uh, gets a race when he really hits through choices. Yeah. Then he can be really dangerous. Yeah. And well, I mean, he's looked pretty precise yet. on the, these next routes, to be honest. Mm, and here he is. It's not over yet. So he was 34 seconds uh, slower than Svensk at control number six. And I think it's mostly due to the brute choice. Mm -hmm. Ah, but this is number eight, so I feel like he would have lost a little bit more time here. Yeah, but I mean, look at this. This is much more attacking than uh, we have seen other runners before. Yeah, you can really see this. The you, way you he's can see the, out. the body language mm. of Bayman. He really wants to prove everyone here that he is in great shape, actually. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, he is. He took all the gold medals in the World Cup in Finland. Um, <laughs> does have great shape. It's Let's see if he can mentally pull together a performance. So, 29 seconds. So he actually gained some bit, time. Yeah, he yeah, was like 34 nice. seconds slower. Looking very strong. And we know that uh, uh, in Svensk opened the window again. I think we hear Olaf Lundin was coming here. Mm -hmm. Here he is. Yes, indeed. Oh, one second slower than Svensk yeah. at control number six. And again, someone, of course, he knows how to fight all the way around the course. And especially at the end of a course where he had such high speed. Yeah, that's a great start for Lundanes. 
And you asked earlier in the race if it's annoying to be together with other runners. It might be kind of annoying to run uh, with London S, both, uh, of course, because of his speed, but it, it sounds quite a lot as well. It, you actually can be distracted of that. But then, I mean, if you can ca keep together with London S, then you will be quite happy about your speed anyway and not be complaining about uh, the sounds. So London is very, very close to the control here. Let's see how his time stacks up compared to Svensk. He's going to be very close, actually. But that's one thing. I mean, you, you can really see and hear that he is pushing all the way. And I think also that his, this, this breathing, like this high volume breathing, is not only because he's tired, but also to mark for himself that I'm pushing, I'm pushing, I'm pushing all the way. And it's, it's some kind of mental thing as well. It's not only that he is actually very exhausted, but that he proves himself that I'm running at the limit. Svensk and Lindenez so close together for a lot of the time. You can see they took a slightly different route up the crags there, but uh, no seconds won or lost at that point. Svensk maybe a little bit better into uh, control six. Here is uh, Glibov, though, through the arena passage. And uh, my feeling is that he has to pace up a little bit if he wants to threat Emil Svensk. Uh, when I think back, I think that uh, Svensk had slightly higher speed here. But it's also a kind of matter of the running style. Svensk does look a little bit faster. Now, Mika Kimmler here does well to, in fact, he has a really great last section of the course. He's overtaken Hovald at that part. He was like 20 seconds slower than Hovald and now going ahead by uh, what a significant margin. So fantastic end of the course there for the Finn. Yeah, great shot by Mika Kirmula, 127 behind. Really, really felt like he was fighting there and uh, no, he had a lot to give on the last part of the course. And that's uh, where he slots into the standings. Here we go, Luca Basse. Feeling that he is a little bit behind, 34 seconds. Also, he is in great shape. Not been uh, running the long distance. Yeah, it will be interesting to see where he lost the time. If it's, uh, I mean, if it's he lost the time physically, then we kind of have to count him out. Mm -hmm. But if it's uh, a bad route in the beginning, then he still, and he can keep the speed with the others, then there's still a chance for him to end up quite up high up in the result list. But I have a feeling that route choice to uh, control four is going to be really decisive in this race, actually. Yeah. Really decisive. And I'm sure you will be able to catch all the analysis after the race on, on that one as well. But and I got that's the, my gut feeling. I got the feeling as well that control 16 is another quite decisive control because uh, if you're hesitating or just uh, Picking a wrong like entrance up to the hill, then it's it can cost you time. And here we are with Matthias Kiburts. Yep, he was slower than Svensk um, at control six. This is control eight. Still got one more before we reach the timing. Yeah, he will be somewhere around Gustav Bergman, maybe. Like a half a minute behind. A 
Daniel Listens world champion from 2016 in uh, Strömstad. Oh. There we go, you can see. Sounded painful. <laughs> yeah. So it was joint fourth with Berryman. And he was the last starter. So Kip off. Here we got the answer on that question. I don't actually know. I don't think he knows where to look. Let's have a look what, what happened. So Svensk uh, was still leading. Oh, that's the a wrong direction out there. Oh, Ooh, that's a really wrong direction. What is he doing? Yeah. He's one of the few to go right of the line. Yeah, the left actually, the it's line. very dense and green there. There are many fallen trees, so you really don't want to be in there. Oh, we oh. lost a lot of time. Mm. Yeah. Now you have to be has to be careful to actually be within uh, the top three in the finish. A lot of nervous uh, Swedish coaches. in the Finnish arena as Thierry Georgiou gives Emil Svensk a massive hug. But there's the control. Number 21. Let's have a look at the replay. This is yeah. Magda Daly as well. She is approximately a minute behind here. And he's punching the control. Going to the right. Well, he came some seconds clo closer, I think. And then we know Svensk loses about 30 seconds at 16. Yeah. <laughs> I don't <laughs> think he will uh, beat him in the finish. It's just they are so similar in their, like, on which level they are. So if you can predict that Svensk did 40, 45 seconds mistake. <laughs> He needs to have a perfect race to even uh, match him. Uh, someone who's not having a perfect race is Daniel Hubman. No. He's lost some more time on the lead, Emil Svensk, and not his day today. Really not uh, Magna Deli in here. So now he has to do a good job here. To the, towards the next control to be able to pick some seconds. It's not very far behind the uh, hoopman. He has just, okay, so he stopped, but then he has gone, at least he has gone left out of that point. Again, spying the same route up. This is, I think, we, this is where we've seen quite a lot of people climbing mm. up this crag. He will. Fall on trees, though. I think he will catch some seconds. Let's see how many. What did he have? 46 seconds before. So uh, Daniel Hoodman has punched the control. He's gone ninth. We'll soon be pushed down into tenth, though, with the arrival of Magna Dali. And. Uh, we have a leave off to the finish now as well. He won't. Among the top four, he came, comes in in fifth position, two minutes and seven seconds behind. But let's focus on Daniel. Yeah, and he's called up those 30 seconds. He was about 51, I think he was 51 behind yeah. at control 14. So, caught up those 30 seconds, or rather, in the sense, lost those 30. So, that's good to have, keep in mind for all the following runners uh, if they are within 30 seconds, for example. Gustav Bergman, then they have a chance here, and uh, he definitely has. And he's catching up time. You can see all the way around this course, he's now only 19 <laughs> seconds behind, and he too looks like he's going left. So that is good news there for Gustav Bergman, as he too, I think, will go the same route as the others. He will, if he keeps going straight on, yeah, he'll go that same route up to the control. It's going to be close. Oh, I really like his body language. He is so much attacking here. You can really feel the power and that he will, he, He's willing to do everything to get a medal now. Tanchon here now into the finish. Really trying to fight this last burst of speed, but he won't be leading. He will, however, go quite nicely into second place. 
haven't seen much of Tranchant at all throughout this course, but, you know, he was third in the arena run through, now into second place with their mistake from uh, Glibov. Looking good. Here's Berman. Focus on Berman, and now he is in the lead. Ooh, so gains 35 <laughs> seconds and uh, looking very good, as you said, body language looking very good. Yep. Whole, catching time the yep. whole way. All the time. Uh, at the same time, I think the part that suited him best will be over now. But it's still, I mean, we are talking about uh, 15 seconds. He's not that slow anyway. And it's still tough. The runnability is still... It, you still need power to run, so it's not uh, just running there. So, Linden is here. And this will be him. So that 13 seconds will be 13 seconds slower than Bellman. Swede as he now goes straight down this slope. And let's take a close look at which route he chooses into Control 16. This is the one that uh, was an issue for Emma Svensk. London Airs already looks like, as he's heading down uh, that way, looks like he will take the same route as Berman. And it's exactly the same with uh, London Airs and Berman. The body language is just, it's just exceptional. I think that's the same way up as all the others, most of the others anyway. And we will get his time at, uh, at the control itself. Actually looking very good for Lindenez compared to Bellerman, which he's, you can already hear him at this control with, I think we have the sound from the camera at this control. Uh, you, know, you can hear him, can't see him. There he is going through the uh, the bushes and this could be a new leading time for Lindenez. And that's what I said, mentioned before, we look at him, he was hesitating, jumping into the three. There was no hesitating at all here of uh, Olaf Lindenez. And Lindenez, well, goes faster again. 14 seconds, Olaf Lindenez. Just as Berman takes the lead, Lindenez snatches it right back off him. Uh, let's see. We have, uh, let's say, two different route choices here. So my guess is that Lundanez is running quicker but hasn't taken the right route choice on this time, which is why maybe he... I think that uh, it was quite similar, if not some seconds faster, the one to the right, so Lundanez was not picking a bad route there, that's my guess. They were not synced from the control. And it's here where Svensk loses time. Going down there, has to go up, climbing again, because it's very green there. And also, I think, losing time yeah. here, going out to the track. Okay. So yeah. live with Lundanez. Hoopman here through the arena, and Magna Dali is going to catch him up. And then uh, we're actually talking uh, about Dali is back in back on track here. Yeah, with goes 12 seconns behind. And Svensk wasn't direct into control 20, so the opportunity to catch up some time, and he looks very good. Hibman doesn't look quite as good. Okay, I have to excuse here. I counted Dali out in the beginning, mm -hmm. but uh, he has proven me wrong. And Daly gets a massive cheer as he goes through the crowd. Gets some great feedback. He's catching meters on Hoopman. And that, of course, has got to give you a fantastic feeling. These two go through here, looking at who is next to come through. We should see Gustav Berman through the arena passage very shortly. Then we have Olaf Lindenez, Luca Basse, and Matthias Kibertz. We haven't seen uh, Kibertz at the or Basse at the um, TV point with the open area yet. Control number 16. Here is Berman, though. Here he is. Yeah, and that's a clearly new leader here. So he was 15 seconds ahead, now it's 22. And he's got to take some 
confidence from Matt as he goes through the arena. Really has to push hard. He knows Londonez is behind him. Mm -hmm. And let's hope, I mean, uh, it's, it's a lot of pressure now. He knows that he is in the lead. Um, he struggled before in World Championships to really get that clean race all the way. And lost some seconds there, exiting the control, I think. Look at the speed. Uh, so let's hope for him that he will have a clear race also in the end. That's really tight. There, I think, actually, that uh, that's a smart choice by London S. He could have kept a bit longer to the path. It's very tough there. Blueberries are high. Ah, but it's very close between the two of them. We're going to see London S very closely. This is uh, Magna Dali compared to Emil Svensk. Ooh, this is one's going to be close too. Here he is. But they are two runners there. He has help of Daniel Hoopman. Again, going slightly from the left, but the control's just in this re-entrant here. So, mm, they two runners now, neck and neck at this point. Yeah, but they are two runners now, so that's an advantage as well. And Svensk but did Svensk was running with uh, a group two. Yeah, but I think he was hesitating a bit more there. Let's see. Now we are waiting for Lundenes to the arena. Here he yes. is. This will be tight, I think. Ooh, seconds in it. And the crowd No, they're going to have to cheer on their man, Lundenes, here. Seven seconds behind. So Gustav Benjamin in the lead here. Seven seconds behind Olaf Lundenes. What can the two of them do? Yeah, but don't forget, Bergman was 28 seconds behind at the first TV control, so his uh, speed seems to be really, really good. We'll have to wait and see. Anything can happen on this last loop. We know we've seen people making mistakes. This is how it played out with the two of them here. Berman looking a little bit quicker. And oh, so close between the two of them. Here he is. Berman's making a mistake. Yeah, is, he? is he really? Yeah, Going a bit maybe. far too fast to the right, but not. I don't I think know, that was so more than like four or five <laughs> seconds. <laughs> I don't know. No, it wasn't that bad. Look at it. Oh, yeah, there we go. OK. It's just going up on the spur. You can see slightly. Well, he's faster than Svensk, but we will wait. Oh, that looks really good. Let's see. Fighting through the green. That's more or less the last control, which is a little bit difficult. But here's Magna Daly, and he's now racing Emil Svensk. Norway versus Sweden, of course. Daniel Hoodman is there too, and it was. He had a two-second lead. The crowd are going to know this. They're going to cheer on the Norwegian into the finish. Well, you, we did count him, out, count him out from the beginning, but he's caught back a lot of time. And now Magna Daly, will he take the new leading time? He does, I think, <laughs> by one second. Ooh, you can see us oh. very disappointed in Svensk out there. One second. This is uh, an exciting middle distance race. We still don't know. Uh, where the gold medal, where the medals are going to go. And but let's see, that can be the medal here. But Luca Basse, we haven't seen much of him. He's having a good race, we can say that much. Yeah, it will be tight again. Look at this. Ooh, so we know Berman went a little bit far further to the south and onto the control. Lindenez is going a little bit to the north. It's going to be so tight here. Yeah, but I wouldn't call it a mistake Berman did. No. It was just some five meters off the direction. Um, and we haven't seen Lundenes there yet. So Lundenes, that's uh, we're live with Lundenes. I mean, he's not going better than Berman on this. Uh, here he is. Here. There he is at the control. I think 
He is still behind, but it's very close as uh, Luca Basse has just gone through the arena. He's gone actually fourth place, but faster than Magna Daly, who's in the current lead. Here's Benjamin, though. He is running for his life. He is running for a medal, probably the gold medal. And all the Swedish fans are getting so excited in here. Has Benjamin finally managed to pull together a race? He looks so confident in his running. He's looking around at the big screen. Don't look, just run, Gustav, as he crosses the line. So he takes the new leading time by 18 seconds. And now he has to wait for two minutes to see. But we have to say that Magna Deli, he came 16 sec seconds closer on this last loop compared to Berman. So a great race by Gustav. I mean, he picked maybe the wrong route there in the very beginning up to control four. But from that point, he really did a great race and you could see his body language. He was prepared for this. He was willing to fight and he was fighting all the way. And now he's the leader in the finish. And uh, I would say there's only one runner left who can beat Berman here. And here he is. And this will be very, very tight. Mm. My guess is that he is a bit late. We're going to see the time here. He's 11 seconds faster. Lindenez goes 11 seconds faster than Berman at this point. Berman had a fantastic last run in and now he's going to have the crowd on his side running on home soil can he make it two out of two Olaf Lundenez puts his head down and it's all about the running now for Olaf Lundenez he's got to get this last control just over the hill yeah, and the crowd enough. with the Norwegian flag are going to cheer him into this finish Olaf Lundenez then it's been a tight battle with Gustav Berman all the way around this course but the Norwegians think he's got it we think he's got it. He's got the final stretch of this course to go. And Olaf Lundenez pumps his arms, goes all the way to the finish. And it's going to be good for the Norwegian. He will take his second title. Lundenez crosses the line, goes fastest by only 11 seconds. And he gets the feedback. He is almost definitely today's winner. So Lundenez collapses. Punches arms, and I think even Gustav Benjamin on the line there was saying, "Fair game, fair game. I'm, I'm happy. I'll settle for second I mean, behind Lundenes." What a last loop by Lundenes! I think he was still some seconds behind at the fourth last control at uh, control 20, and then uh, he just turned up the speed a lot there in the very end. And uh, 11 seconds—that's that's a march, and that's. I mean, yeah, I mean, compared to, you know, the one second that Magna Daly has over Emma Svensk, then, yeah, you know, Let's see here. See if anything happens still here. Still, advantage, Berryman. Oh, there, control 21. Yeah. Oh, and not as direct. Oh, there was actually was a small mistake there. Yeah, that's it. It's just too, a little bit too much, but, I mean, still uh, a great race. By, what a battle. I mean, uh, great race by both of them. We're very happy for Gustav. I know he will be a little bit uh, disappointed now. He was so close to the gold medal, but still, finally, he got his uh, individual medal here and uh, very fair here as well. Uh, he knows that it was a, a battle on a very high level, so uh, there's nothing to be sorry about. Well, let's have a look here. We're looking for Luca Basse, and if he has a good race, he's still in with the shout of a medal. I think he's still in with that chance, uh, as uh, in he, he would be pushing Magna Daly out of a medal spot if he's able to do this. In fact, he's had a he has pain, blinder. Right? Isn't, he, isn't he like, I, he's not running very, I don't know, but he goes second at this point. Oh no, he doesn't, he goes, to, he's no, minute no, down. No. Oh, that's why, this is for the finish, oh, sorry. So he's not in with the shout of a medal, but he is in with the shout of a podium. Uh, Luca Basse now into the finish. He's the second to last starter.
for Luca Vasse. In here, it's going to go ahead of his teammate, Frédéric Tonchon, and we'll end up with a podium position here. Haven't seen much of him throughout the course, but really, really hurting on this final section and finishes there fifth. And now we also can see that it's the first individual medal to Magnadelli with a bronze medal this race because there's no more threat of any other runner. No, how's Kibetz doing? Uh, he was in 10th position at the Arena Passage, 149 behind. So let's see the last loop here. We have still... This is the fight for the bronze medal. Svensk uh, with the advantage here, but we know that he is doing a mistake. Passé also doing a mistake there. Then still... Yeah, it was this the direction out of the control. He got stuck in the green area there. Um, yeah, this last loop, it was quite decisive anyway. We yeah. thought it would be mostly about the speed, but it was, I mean, it's about the fine tuning in the technique. Oh. Ooh, that's not right. He has to go more up to the left. It's not the race on Matthias Kiburz here. Uh, he's still think he's too low. Yeah. Oh, he, oh, he's gone left. Yeah. Yeah, and then Lots. come across and then to far. Yeah, and now he's gone through all the area with the. Um, as you can Green. see here, he has more or less given up. I mean, he was going for the medals when you he hears at the arena passage that there's... Uh, you can see the track here. That should help him, actually. You can hear at the arena passage, he might uh, have a feeling in the foot as well, and then there's some problems coming. He's maybe not uh, willing in his head to go all in, for, or like, he's not willing to, to take the pain all the way and maybe he's tired and too tired to actually do the job there in the last part. Ah, there he is, so he's yeah. punched the control on the way uh, to the next one, number 21. Yeah, you yeah. can see but how he will that mistake was now. Fall out at the top 10 here, that's for sure. Maybe even out of top 20, we have to see. Keyboards now on the way to the second last control. You can really see that he is not fighting very hard here. And it looks as if he's in pain, maybe. down here towards second last control. Yeah, he lost a lot of time. Lost two and a half minutes here. In the last loop. Got into the race, fifth position, 
at the first radio or TV control, 29 seconds behind, and then 139 behind at the second TV, so he was never really, really up there in the fight uh, that we had the top runners, Lundanes, Berryman, Danny, and Svensk between each other. Um, so we'll be just inside the top 20 here in 18th position. Matthias Kibbutz. So here, the final results. We have the world champion again, as in the long distance from Norway, Olav Lundanes, second place, first individual medal, Gustav Bergman from Sweden, and also the first individual medal to Magne Daly from Norway. And uh, very soon we will hear some words of the world champion Olav Lundanes. So Olav, gold medal number two. This one was a lot closer. How did it feel out in your race? Did it feel like a winning race? Oh, it was a tough race. Uh, the appeal to number four took a lot of uh, energy, so the feeling was not uh, uh, very good in the quite rough terrain over there, but technically it was really good and I expect that everybody was struggling physically because it was uh, quite tough. So. Uh, I, I thought I didn't have so much to <laughs> push with on the last loop, but I found quite a lot of extra energy uh, with all the help from the spectators and all the cheering, so um, thank you. And what kind of feedback did you get when you came through this arena? Uh, I, I heard I was a few seconds behind and uh, it was, uh, I was not hoping for anything more. Uh, and it, I was uh, luckily it was quite rough last loop, so it was possible with good orienteering to pick the necessary seconds. We've seen quite a lot of people making a mistake uh, in the last few controls, in the last loop. How were you able to keep focus? Oh, I, I maybe learned a lesson uh, last year, so I think that was the victory, um, what helps, helped me to the victory today. Congratulations, Olaf. Thank you. Thank you. So that was the world champion in the middle distance, Olav Lundanes, and here we see how we got the title in the beginning. Yeah, very good speed from the beginning compared to the other runners, Daly and Bergman. Uh, we also know that Emil Svensk had a great start here, so they were very similar in this part. Uh, he mentioned it, tough leg up to control four, it's costing a lot of energy, but uh, no technical problems at all for Lundanes in this part where the visibility was very good. Uh, then also we choose to exit the control towards the path there. We have seen other runners doing that and losing time, but not so Lundanes. Going all the way up on the hill to approach control 12, down to 13, and control 14. Control, we've seen many of the women having problems. And then this quite decisive control 16, we have seen uh, Emil Svensk losing half a minute there. The finish is ex exactly one uh, half a minute behind. Uh, and then this last part, which looks Easy and fast, but as London has mentioned, it was very, very rough in this area. And he learned his lesson from last year and could keep it together on the very last part here. See that still it is Berryman in the lead here, but doing a small mistake down to control 22, just enough to get passed by London S and losing the gold medal. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I have two pretty great races uh, with, uh, with what you've seen. And I mean, it's, uh, we have two new, uh, two runners with the first individual uh, medal at World Championships and both doing actually almost a perfect race. I mean, Magne Daly, he lost time in the beginning. Uh, I already counted him out, more or less, but uh, he fighted himself back. Uh, the same for Berman, but he was 
he was also a half minute behind in the beginning and fight it all his way back. I really liked his attitude in the forest. You could really see both of them, Lundanes and Belmont, fighting all the way, attacking every green area. Uh, and I mean, that's a thing you can do when you're really willing and you know that your shape is great. Uh, you know you're going for the medals and... Uh, I mean, it's well deserved, all of the medals here. It's a pity for Svensk, he misses the medals by one second. Um, he could have won it, I mean he was very close and kind of gave it away on the last loop. Which was more technical actually uh, than we thought. Yeah, yeah it was, we saw really quite decisive here. We're actually just waiting now for Olaf to finish his uh, interview with Norwegian TV and he's going to run over and we're going to get this uh, uh, flower ceremony done. And uh, But yeah, we can see here into uh, some of the rest of the results. Tira Lassen there ending with 16th, Finnish Nikodim 15th. Good results in the Czech team. We've got to take in 14th there as well. Kiberts will be disappointed with that 18th, as I'm, I'm sure mm, he says. I'm a bit afraid. He looked a bit in pain when he uh, came to the last controls. I hope that it's not uh, the injury he had from before and that everything will be all right for the relay tomorrow. So we're going to go across. Here it is, the uh, flower ceremony. Oh, look, they've got a podium here today. That's quite nice. And um, we will be able to award the flowers. The uh, medal ceremonies will take place later on today in uh, the center of Salzburg. Norway, the men's middle distance final. The flowers will be awarded by Inger Skell, member of the parliament of Norway, from Østfold and also from this region, Spiderberg. In third place, representing Norway, Magne Dari. So a fantastic fight back in the latter stages of the race. Magna Daly is uh, well rewarded with the third place and the bronze. And uh, you have to remark another two Norwegians on the podium today, as the same as yesterday. The man with the, one of the biggest smiles, he's uh, managed to put together that race. He was, um, you know, very supportive of Olaf's victory and... Uh, very happy for him, actually, yeah. that he really got the race that leads him to a medal because he, everyone knew that he is uh, ready for it. Absolutely. But it feels that Lundanes, he was the runner. He wanted it the most. He wanted to have this Middle Eastern gold medal on the home soil. Yeah, his second gold medal at the Middle Distance. He's more of a, a, a favorite for the long distance. So to do it on the Middle Distance, where there's he's not as much of a favorite is maybe it feels more of a sense of a the, the thing is that there are not as many runners able to keep this high speed all the way and really fighting down all the negative feelings that are coming up when you're tired uh, and he is really he is really really good at that and in the middle distance there are quite many runners who can keep the pace for 40 uh, 35 40 minutes so for him, it's it's uh, tougher to win a, a middle distance, I think. Mm. Yeah, I would have to agree with you there. But some happy Norwegian fans, and I think we can say two really, really great races. We will be back again tomorrow with the relay, with the women's starting at 20 past four, the men's at uh, 6.30. So we will be back then for hopefully another set of fantastic races here in Osvald. See you then. See ya.